Greeks and, and Croatians. And uh, the other important example <clears throat> we heard today concerns leptogenesis, and it's again mainly flavor mixing and coherence that plays the role here. But also, as Bjorn said, it could be particle and type particle coherence. And as a matter of fact, somebody, I think Howard mentioned that it would be nice to see also study this region where both flavor and particle antiparticle coherence are relevant. And I think Bjorn was referring that it would be nice to study. Well, I tell you that here are the equations which you can do use to study that it's from the paper by myself and Henry Jukkala recently. In, in this equation, set of equations you have, uh, this includes all the particle antiparticle coherences as well as the flavor indicated here by indices S and S prime, flavor coherence in this indicated by indices A and J, and then it goes in more simple so it's all explained there. So just if you just want to study, just go on and use it. So <clears throat> third example, important example concerns electric barrier genesis, and there the coherence concerns uh, left and right moving states. We talk about that there's a phenomena of quantum reflection and semi-classical force. And on this side, I want to report here just to say shameless self-promotion. I want to promote this, um, my recent work where I showed that <clears throat> essentially this, well, I, I promoted the semi-classical force to include all the uh, leading thermal corrections and showed that the, the, the competing uh, formalism called this VIA and make, uh, approximation is actually erroneous it's really just spurious. Those sources which have been reported and used, I think, in hundreds of papers of electric barriers are actually zero. And this was recently agreed by, by people in the VIA camp. So, so that's one another important coherence application. And of course, happy to talk about these things in, in, in this kind of breakout rooms and so on. But my topic today is about particle production by classical fields and thermalization and thermalization. And here the coherence <clears throat> we are talking about is particle and particle coherence. And of course, you could talk about favor depending on how complicated model you are studying as well. But here I'm concentrating on this thing. And uh, what I, uh, my aim is to find the ab initio description for the evolution of coherent system in interacting with the decoherent, also with interacting with the decoherent environment. And if you want to do that, uh, the framework of choice is 2PI framework, in my opinion, where you can include interactions in self-consistent way or in some well-defined approximations. One of the important things where that happens is that when you include in interactions, you are necessarily encounter the infinities you typically encounter in field theory when you go to higher loops. So, we need to have a consistent renormalization scheme. And more than half of my talk are actually going to be, is going to be about explaining how this renormalization procedure can be implemented in, in these systems we study. And then the second half or maybe one third, last third, I talk about some examples where we uh, study the, we use these formalisms to study uh, back reaction and non-equilibrium modes, the classical field evolution, which you can also study with, with lattice methods and have been done. But, you know, I do this in this uh, two-pi formalism. We, we encounter spinodal instability or tachyonic instability, parametric resonance, and follow the thermalization of a toy model. We study that method production. And, and, and I forgot to mention, I also want to study where we have a project. Okay, sorry, this, uh, this work is all related to ben, mainly to work with my student, Oli Koskivara, and with Sami Nurumi. And also, <clears throat> I, I, as I mentioned, something about the work we are uh, doing with Anna Pokarev. So, oh, this does not want to move. Okay, so here are just the contents very quickly. Most of the time, I'm most of the talk, I'm talking about 2PI method, the action, the normalization, is deriving the momentum space equation motions, which you actually can solve in practice and which are fine. And then I study some, uh, give some examples where we see particle production in a toy model with the tachyonic and parent resonances, study the role of heart collisions and thermalization. And then we go on to, to study, uh, this was done in the <clears throat> Minkowski background, but then 
I also study a non-minimally couple of spectator feed in the curved background, and, and there we study uh, how the uh, Ricci scalar causes uh, um, tachyonic instability and parameter resonance and leads to the dark matter, dark matter production of random inflation. And finally, a few words of the Palatini Higgs inflation, which uh, in the model that's been studied recently by Inara and others. Okay, so let's let me go to the, the bread and butter. Uh, the two PI method. <clears throat> here I of course start from somewhere in the middle. Uh, if you if you study too hard uh, thermal field theory, you, you spend 20, 50, 30 pages drawing this um, two PI action, which is as general as field theory itself. It's a generalization from the from the idea of the one PI action, which is only function of the classical field. Here you take the classical field and also the two point function to be dynamical variables that are to be defined by equations of motion uh, derived from this action. And, and all the approximation that you might be making are contained into the, in this interaction part. All these first pieces are just generic. In the interaction part, and the approximations are defined by the truncation that you are doing. In, uh, in the ex essentially coupling constant expansion. So you can, at the lowest order, you just include this uh, figure eight diagram in your interaction term. So that, that's called the hard tree approximation. And this is what I'd be actually be doing mostly in this study, essentially. So when you have your 2PI action, <clears throat> the equations of most I, I described, I denote the 2PI action by the blue blob and the uh, interaction part by the, group, by the gray one. The equations of motion are essentially uh, requiring that the variations with respect to the, to the propagator and, and classical field vanish. And the first one can be used to derive essentially what is the Schringer Dyson equation, it can be written in several ways. Here's one way, here's another one. It's the same thing in a more complicated, complete expression. The important thing is that after you done this variation, that your solution essentially depends on the classical field. So when you are finding the uh, minimum of the classical field, you have to always do, remember to differentiate or with respect to the classical field, but also use the change rule. Uh, and, and differentiate with respect to <clears throat> the um, effective action uh, with the property. In the end, what you what you find, you find in this way, you find certain equations of motion, which in the hard tree case where the, the, the self energy function is simple, just the local uh, singular uh, term with the delta function, these equations of motion reduce into this particularly simple form. And this is what we want to solve. However, there's a problem that there's a quantity in these equations which is divergent. This local correlation function is divergent in the field theory and needs to be normalized. So how do you do that? <clears throat> and that's what I want will really spend hopefully not more than the next 10 minutes uh, very quickly. So what you'd want to do in the renormalization, you want to fix the physical parameters of the theory by considering the uh, various physical endpoint function, two-point function, three-point function, four-point function of your effective action, evaluate it at the solution of the, of the, of the classical property. And when you start to compute, let's say, two-point function <clears throat> from this expansion, you encounter, uh, you're taking these differentials to the, this, the, the classical field using the chain rule, you, you see that you all of a sudden start to see different types of vertices. Like here, for example, you see, two different three-point functions to the one here, which is uh, the fundamental three-point function of the two one PI action. And what happens in two PI is that in any finite truncation, these different three-point functions are really, really different. So you have to, it's not enough to have, so in all, and they are also, to define them, you need to have more, many new renormalization conditions. So as a matter of fact, each coupling in field splits into a number of renormalized couplings and fields, depending on how many uh, physical uh, fields are associated with uh, the diagram or the endpoint function uh, in question. For example, this, this has only one classical field and two, two legs are associated with, um, with internal propagators. So 
and so so and, and so on. So and this has two and these are all different. I mean there's a systematic way of, of, of following the procedure of defining all these uh, propagators and running coupling to encounter the Koyani Barberges and other collaborators. But there's also a so kind of faster way based on something called cancellation subdivergences. And these methods are actually at, I mean, they are the same in the end of the day. But this is fast. So let's see how it works kind of very. Um, quickly, I know. I'm sorry. This is very, very busy, busy slide. But what we have, what I have done here, I have rewritten these equations of motion in terms of renormalized parameters, accounting, taking into account how many classical field is associated with each operator. Here. So where the, where did they come from in the original action? So this was had four. This had two. This had this had none. It came from the Sorry, this have this have none. It came from from the figure eight, and so you start by renormalizing your actually auxiliary propagated delta uh, in the usual way, which sets the renormalization constant for z is zero to one, and you you, you require that it's on shell and p squared is on square, and you define uh, the one point function require it vanishes at some. Uh, renormalized value of the field, and we are using actually interested in Mexican have potential. So, so this is going to be non-zero value. Even when you do this, you are still left only with two equations containing five counter terms, six renormalized parameters. So after that, you make some choices. You you connect the kern, what we call what I call kerns. You see, there's this lambda four and the associated counter term. There are connections, natural connections between different kernels coming from the renormalized, assuming that the related bare parameters are equivalent. A notable difference is with this kernel four, where you have to introduce this one third in order to have a user renormalization of your bed. So this is imposed by the renormalization condition. So when you use all these choices in this blue equation, which is what's left from this one, and you take out all the constant pieces and, and require that they themselves define the renormalized mass on the left hand side, you're left with the condition for the vanishing of the parts that contain the divergences or the counterterms. You reorganize this thing. This is just the same thing. And you just, uh, you can you can see that it reorganizes into pieces which are multiple. There's a constant piece multiplied by this quantity, and there's a, another piece which contains things which depend in particular depend on you know arbitrary field and arbitrary content of the of two point function. And you require these to vanish separately. When you do this, now you have almost enough uh, renormalization conditions. You can define all the kernels. You can find the con connections between the uh, lambda two, lambda zero, mu two, mu zero. You can you, you actually can solve for the kernel exactly. You find the running couplings. You solve the kernel for the mass. You find the running mass coupling, and you can. And then, then due to this uh, special condition here, there's a special that the lambda four coupling does not run. It's a constant. The neat thing about this renormalization is that when you go to beyond the renormalization point, so you allow the field value to change and allow any fluctuations, whatever, in this finite part of two point correlator, you still define the physical mass from the constant pieces, uh, uh, finite pieces. You plug it back and rearrange, and you see that miraculously. All the infinities that may contain temperature dependence, out of equilibrium conditions in the two point function arbitrary field, these are still cancelled by the same constant counter terms that led to the, the, the finiteness of the, uh, at the renormalization point. So we encounter finite, totally finite, well defined equations in motion in this procedure. Let me now skip the time is passing so that. At this level, I haven't yet defined the, the, the two point, um, this, the um, Z2 wave function normalization factor, nor ha I have really related lambda 4 to any physical 
mass of physical coupling. You can do this by studying effective potential. It's easy to derive, and then you take the fourth derivative of it. So then you know this is something that you can relate to, uh, to, to the physics. So fourth derivative of the effective potential is essentially coupling, physical coupling defined at the zero external momentum. You can relate that into the physics, uh, into this lambda four, and and you can invert the relation, relate lambda four over r to lambda. You're still not done. You still have to figure out what this r is. For that, you need to study the. Uh, Two point, the true two point function, I skip the details, but just to tell you, they are all here. This is all you need to figure out what the wave function normalization factor is in terms of uh, this lambda r to the four. Now in the p squared equal to zero, you can do other momentum choice as well if you wish. But here eventually I have a relation with, that gives the essentially the wave function normalization factor in terms of the physical carbon point. And when I have that, I can compute what lambda four is in terms of physical carbon and so on, all the rest of the copies. Now I have defined my theory entirely in terms of physical parameters only, and it's all fine. Next to the solution. How do you solve these equations? Here they are still written in real space. What we do, we go to the Wigner representation by Wigner transforming our two point function in the Wigner space. Uh, the equation turns into something which contains an infinite power of radian, infinite order expansion gradient. So that's kind of bad, looks very difficult, but the solution is to go to the moment, introduce moment functions, which are essentially frequency weighted uh, integrals over this Wigner transform two point function. And when you use this approach, this equation can be turned into a closed set of uh, moment equation for the three lowest moments, zero, one, and two. All the rest can be related to these cars uh, uh, recursively in the non-interacting limit. When you go to the interacting limit, things get a little more difficult, and you have to uh, have some other approximations that it can be handled. Now, these equations are coupled. They look very simple, but they are very complicated. There's a very complicated coupling through this effective mass which contains these uh, parameters, which can be all expressed in three physical parameters. There's field dependent mass, there's contribution, contribution to the two point function. And there, here are the fluctuations. When we solve these equations, we, we, solve, we start from the, the, the vacuum solution. And as the system evolves, you are start to develop fluctuations on top of the vacuum. And those fluctuations on top of the vacuum are, uh, are um, reacting back into the mass term and it's affecting the evolution of the system. And now important note, when you are in the tachyonic regime, if you want to set up your system in the tachyonic regime, you have to not, you must not include uh, tachyonic fluctuations into your two point function because you know, with the home, it's not consistent with the homogeneous field configuration nor the analytic continuation of the effective potential to the tachyonic regime. Uh, you can compute the uh, thermal Hartree effective potential in this way just by 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 you no know, by taking these fluctuations here to be thermal, and and you know, I just skip this. I just point out that when you do this, you find and compare it to the other uh, resumed one loop resumed uh, effective potentials. You tend to find out that the Hartree potential is uh, gives the strongest transition, which seems to be more consistent with the lattice results than the other resonation methods. Now let's go to the result transfer case. Okay, so I think I'm pretty, it's 20 minutes, so maybe 10, 15 minutes to the, uh, to the results. <clears throat> now, so what we have now are these equations. I first, oops, I first study this case with the non-interacting limit. So I have, <clears throat> I start with the Mexican hat potential and the system sitting at the side of the Mexican potential with zero, uh, with just the vacuum R3 potential here, given by this red line, and let it start to roll down. So classically would not, we start actually from a value which is lower than the maximum point of the potential here. So classically it could not pass this point. But it actually does. And what happens is that as the field rolls down and goes past this point, particles are being produced. 
those particles back react to the effective action, lowering the effective free energy barrier between the two vacua, and the field actually happily passes to the other. Actually, it makes one oscillation. So you can see here, it makes one oscillation, the first one, and then it passes through and settles into the second one. All this is caused by spinodal instability because when we when we plot the uh, modes that are created uh, uh, in this in this uh, system, they are all lying between zero and some maximum value, which which is consistent with the uh, with the values of the mass here in the spinodal regime, which says that they they are they all correspond at unit modes. One point to note here is that effective potential is not due uniquely defined, no particular useful in outer equilibrium situations. You cannot first derive the effective potential and then derive the equations of motion. It's the other way around. You have to solve the equations of motion, renormalize the equations of motion, and reconstruct the effective potential afterwards if you want. And there are several ways that you can do it, and we expressed some of those here. Let us study another <clears throat> example where a parametric resonance is at, at place. We are actually using the same basic parameters that we did in the previous example. We are just starting from higher, somewhere higher in the potential so that we have more speed that the field, field actually rapidly oscillates from one side to another, as is shown here. There is actually a slight parametric uh, spinodal effect here, which we see by plotting this effective mass term uh, given in here, this effective mass term is plotted in this corner plot. And you see that the effective mass does go to negative a little bit, but it doesn't of cause a terribly large effect uh, because when, even though we see, do see a large rise in the, in the particle number, which can be computed from these uh, moment functions like this, that particle number is mainly clearly mainly due to a parametric resonance. We see a very clear parametric resonance band here in the system corresponding to Matthew Q value of the value of two. Actually, there are more subbands appearing, uh, appearing later, which are reason for these second and third and fourth rises in the, in the, in the particle number. Uh, from this plot, you can see that this particle number, the system is highly coherent. Uh, this, this quantity here measures the quantum coherence this function is here, some you can relate it if you are familiar, more familiar with the Bobolibob -bo 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 coefficients, you can relate this guy to a mixture of the diagonal and off-diagonal Bobolibob -bo coefficients. So in a, in a non-coherent system, this, this is necessarily zero. And it, so, so we just compute its absolute value in the the case, so we see that the system is highly coherent. Now we do the same thing introducing hard uh, collisions. We do that uh, phenomenologically, not by component to higher order in 2 pi expansion, which is what you would want. And that would actually be straightforward, but well, it's hard. So it's much easier to do hard collision by, 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 by doing something called relaxation uh, approximation. As a matter of fact, I'm sure I, I actually know that you can derive this kind of equations approximately from this 2 pi expansion, including at the higher orders going to the local limit in the collision terms. And that's fine. It's very important to study the left-hand side of the equations accurately to get the quantum coherence phenomena correctly described. But when you go to a deep coherent interactions, there's much more freedom in, in, in treating those. Their, their precise form of knowledge is much less important for the qualitative and quantitative behavior of the system. So we do here a toy model. And what you see with this toy model is that these collision terms do what you expect. They, they start to move the, the modes from the, from the uh, parametric resonance band or throughout everywhere in, in the phase space. And they also lead to the decoherence as expected. Eventually, when you follow the system much longer in time, you see that it entirely thermalizes. Here you see some, actually these are kind of uh, snapshots of this figure and, and at uh, some time. Five, five minutes. Yeah, thanks. So, um, <clears throat> so you see that initially at early times, there's highly non-thermal 
low energy particle distributions, but as the time goes on, you go into this thermal, very thermal. Room. You can see this by defining an effective temperature by equating the, the, the energy in the fluctuations with the energy in the thermal fluctuations, and you see that this thermal temperature actually reaches a constant value. And this system is a Minkowski, no background evolution, so the temperature is conserved. Another thing you can compute is the, the equation of state parameter by computing the pressure in the fluctuation and pressure in the fields and dividing by uh, energy in the fluctuation plus energy in the field, you get the equation of state. You see that initially the system starts between kination and the vacuum dominance and it reaches a thermal radiation limit when the system is thermalized. Other applications, <clears throat> I will go a couple of minutes over 30, but not, not too much of it. Uh, we are studying a uh, non minimally coupled spectator field with Oli, Ops, and, and Sami. This is in preparation, hopefully, it appears in, in a week or two. So here we study uh, a field minimally coupled to non minimally coupled to gravity. We go to the conformal time and rescale field into, into, into quantum units. Then the action can be written in this way, uh, where this is now normal derivative, and we have an effective uh, mass term, uh, conformal time dependent mass term, which if mass, this guy we take usually very small. So you see that this mass term oscillates between positive and negative values if the Ricci scalar does so. Does so. And this leads actually to a tachyonic instability in this, in this model as well. In this case, we assume that this chi is a spectator field, so that the scale factor evolution is entirely driven by inflation. And we make the ensure this by our choice of parameters and check it that this is so. So, so R is a different driven by inflation, inflation, pressure motion, inflation, as is the Hubble term. We allow for damping in the interval. Uh, we study this, this system with and without damping in the interval. The setup is similar to models studied earlier by before it and others in 2006. And we also studied this with Sami and Malcolm Fairbairn and Tom Markkanen with the simpler CFT tools in, in, in 2019. The moment derivation of moment, moment expansion is, is very similar to, to what I, I showed in the, in the simpler case without the, with the curvature. So I don't need to spend any Time in that the essential only thing is that you get one more new coupling, you get one more new running uh, coupling pi. But but in the end of the day, you are getting a very similar looking equation to motion, except that in the disaffected mass term contains this piece coming from the uh, Ricci scale. When you go to the moment equations, you use from these equations, you introduce the moment equations again. And since we are actually studying non interacting case here, we can. There is a, there, these moment equations actually have even one conserved quantity, this xk, which we can use to eliminate row two from the equation. So we only have an equation for the field and, and this the zeroth moment. Actually, row one is also just one half in this pure hard tree case. So this is a very simple looking set of equations. And indeed, it is really simple. So all the difficulty is here in this mass term, which in which, which depends on the field, how the field evolves. It depends on the Ricci scalar. It depends on the condensate that is being created into this two-point function. This is the two-point local cond cond condensate, local two-point function, or the condensate, chi-chi condensate. This is just chi condensate. And there's uh, some small vacuum correction, which is hardly relevant. These three terms are fight for the, for, for, for the decisive role in the dynamics of the system. Here are some examples. We start with a non-interacting, non damped inflation case, take psi to be 50, study the cases where lambda is 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 4, or 10 to the minus 1, and there are some other parameters that we set in the model. And when we start the system, you see here, there's a very nice spinodal growth here in the initial stages. The blue line corresponds to 10 to the minus 7, red one to 10 to the minus 4, and, and yellow is 10 to the minus 1. Here you see what's going on in some, under the hood. This is the co moving effective mass, just what I, this guy here, plotted. 
uh, for each case, each of the no, each of the three cases. And you see, in the blue case, it just continues continuously oh, falls down. This is because in this case, the system remains always dominated by the Ricci scale. You can see it here in, in, in this block, the, the mass, effective mass one has been uh, broken into the part that comes from, uh, from the uh, Ricci scale, that's the blue one. Uh, sigma field is yellow one, and, and, and the rest is essentially common. So that's the, 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 the uh, in the violet. So here it's just parameter, uh, tachyonic all the way. In the set, two other cases, the tachyonic regime ends and is replaced by parametric uh, region, where the condensate starts to drive the parameter resonance. It's not the feed signal, but it's the condensate that drives this parameter resonance in these uh, two other cases. And that leads to an additional, you can see it actually from these this, uh, plots which show the, um, uh, the distribution of, uh, of quanta in K space as a function of time. You see that in the first case, it's only the, you can see only the spinodal uh, tachyonic region excited. In this, and that's the blue curve. In the red curve, you see that there's a strong tachyonic initial growth, but then there's a parameter, there are parametric, several parametric re regions emerge on top of that. And in the third case, there's a very kind of weakish uh, tachyonic phase followed by mixture of tachyonic and parametric and, and several uh, uh, parametric beds in this region here. This system, this was, this is a picture from the earlier study in, in Fairburn and others paper, and you can see done in the adiabatic approximation, and you can see that although this is actually in different units, unfortunately, but you can see that the system is, the different behavior is both quantitative and qualitatively very different. This approach completely misses, for example, the parametric residence. Uh, we should take some minutes for questions. Yeah, I'm coming to conclusion. So we can see the particle production here, and you can study the case with non-zero gamma. The essential, the only difference is that now the Ricci scalar is driven to zero by, um, not by just the scale factor dependence, but also by the interactions, and therefore uh, the mass terms reach the condensate limit earlier, but the, uh, it's qualitatively, it's the same, qualitatively very different. Let me go to the last uh, slide before the uh, conclusions, and this concerns the model of palatine Higgs uh, inflation that, that, that we are studying with, with uh, Sami and, oops, and Anna. And this is the very same model studied recently by, by, by Inar and others. And, and this here, this is a model, uh, Palatini, I mean, we've seen the Palatini model already. I just point out that, that this is actually not um, renormalizable theory so that we can't use entirely all the machinery that I explained earlier as such, but the <clears throat> UV physics mostly decoupling these systems. Uh, and it, so we, we can implement this, this, this setup in our, our model by replacing essentially the feed dependent mass by couplings of uh, by derivatives, certain number of couplings by derivatives. And, and here's essentially the setup that we need to solve. We haven't done that yet, but it's just almost there. I wish to have done it so that we could have compared to these lattice results by, 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 by these other people, but unfortunately not. Time was not permitting, but we can do this and then compare this approach to the to the lattice results, which are which is different in, in several ways. And I stop here with my conclusions, and I let you ask questions, if any. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. And now is uh, time for questions. I see Andre. You can maybe go first. Okay, thank you very much. I have I have five questions, but okay, I, I'll just ask the first one. So, uh, so in the beginning, you mentioned that you you, you studied electronic baryogenesis uh, uh, with a, with a moving wall, and you studied how particle symmetries behave near the bubble and so on. But did you also take into account the reaction of the environment on the propagation of the wall? And uh, does your method allow you to to, to do this? 
I think what you are referring to is an integral part of the calculation of the wall speed in the uh, hydrodynamical limit, where it's controlled by the interactions with the plasma. And this is, of course, done in the semi-classical approach, usually, where so the, 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 the term that causes out of equilibrium fluctuations that lead to the compensating pressure on the wall. This is created by essentially m prime over two omega type of Forster, m squared prime over two omega. So there's a semi-classical force which pushes particles out of, and out, out of equilibrium. And yes, this is precisely what you compute. There mm -hmm. are several different appro approximations where you can, you usually, you do that usually using some fluid approximations or, uh, and so on, or, or you can you can uh, par parameterize the delta. I've recently that people have written papers where they give uh, moment parameter parameterizations in terms of momentum for this delta f, non out of equilibrium fluctuation, and then create create a set of algebraic equations from which they solve the coefficients in those expansions, and in that way obtain the obtain these fluctuations in each. But it's an integral part of the of the procedure. Uh, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, partially. Thanks. I think Danny was also, Danny Figueroa was also having a question. Uh, hi, Kimo. Very nice talk and very interesting topic. I actually mm -hmm. have also five uh, questions, but I'm going <laughs> to just make <laughs> a comment one. and maybe <laughs> later on we can discuss further. Okay. The comment is something very specific. This particular case of the non minimal coupling to gravity you were bringing up. I just wanted to bring your attention that we have studied this recently in the LARIS uh, last year. Uh, with, uh, no, before, before. Your, the, the whole uh, periodic tachyonic uh, instability that you get uh, when you couple non-minimally scalar field and the rich scalar oscillates and then induces tachyonic... Uh, this one, yeah. 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 So I just wanted to bring your attention that we have studied this with a new method in the lattice, like very recently, a few months ago, with the full nonlinearity. And it would be great if you guys uh, could do the comparison to that, uh, because that's a new method we introduced in the lattice to do the full nonlinearities in the Jordan frame. And uh, we got some nice uh, stages uh, during nonlinear dynamics. And it would be wonderful if you could really compare with this. We did it in the context of geometric preheating which is simply that the inflaton oscillates and you have a spectator field that is coupled non-minimally to gravity. And then it gets excited because of the oscillations of the, of the curvature term induced by the oscillations of the inflaton. Okay, uh, and it, it, I, I think I your think technique would be lovely to see uh, to what extent they match, uh, you know, lattice simula ordinary lattice simulations compared to your technique. Okay, so yeah, I actually do remember your paper but you see why you see I'm, I'm just letting it from the behind because you know you have to invite me for a one month in valencia next I will. Summer, I winter will. when it's very lousy in finland and then we do it together we should definitely talk also about gravitational waves from 2pi for my listeners absolutely yes yes yes, 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 yes. no no uh, seriously we are uh, thank, thanks for the comment we are definitely going to take a look at let's yes. discuss a little bit later and then i show you a bit yeah. the details and how is it will be for you the comparison yeah right good also I'm looking forward to that. Having a question, I please be brief. Yes, I have very short, short questions. So, well, I have five, but yeah, the one of them is short. So, uh, in, in these equations, which you have, for example, on this slide, you have the sigma, or in previous slides it was phi, and in principle, you, you also need some lattice. Uh, you, you need to discretize it on lattice if you want uh, different think, Is that what you are I doing? I think I okay. went from I went from chi to sigma. So chi was the original field, and the sigma was the scale. Field. Yes, but in general, in the procedure, so so you also solve like a number of equations for every momentum mode. Is this correct? Oh yes, 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 yes. Like technically, this 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 these moments. Yeah, I was very brief on this. So when you are making the weakening transformation, I actually failed to say that we make. A, so where is it? Let me. Mm, this is a bit slow, so I have to. So you see here. Oh, yeah, it goes away. Where did it go? Somehow this is slow, really, really slow. Oh, it's the zoom you now. So I'm sorry, I went to that. No, I hope it stops now. 
So we made a Fourier trans weakness transform with, with respect to time temporal coordinates, but then we made the ordinary Fourier transform with respect to uh, spatial coordinates, assuming that the system is homogeneous. So, so we actually have a this. This is a set of equations for all momentum maps. So, so, so typically we have a few hundreds or even up to thousands of moment, uh, different momentum modes in, in, in our uh, setup. So there's one, only one field mode, but there's three moments which each have, say, 1,000. We, we go with 1,000 or so. Are, are you doing a one-dimensional grid for uh, uh, taking those no moments? Grid, no grid, no grid, no okay. grid. Uh, and the moment, you can choose those moments whatever way you like. We, we okay. find it to be uh, as long as you cover the essential physics and there's enough of them. So we typically use, oh, actually, I mean, we'll be trying, sometimes you use logarithm. I think here we used actually linear spacing that, that worked, worked well. For this method, it really doesn't matter. Okay. And there's no grid like in the lattice. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. And, and, and what, yeah. Yeah, what, what is actually surprising with this is that how lightly this system runs with even a very, very large number of modes. So, so we are really not computer time bounded here. So the situation would get more difficult if when you go beyond, if you go beyond hard tree and start um, uh, solving the self-consistent because you see when you go beyond hard tree what happens is that this gap equation for the effective mass becomes a gap equation for for the uh, for the self-energy function which is a function of momentum so you don't actually solve it once but you solve it for all different momenta we are actually also doing that already and even that works surprisingly fast so i think it's even doable going beyond hard tree but it's a bit hard I think Misa is possible to ask a question. Yeah, short question. In page 16, uh, you said that you're considering hard collisions, and I didn't get what, what do you mean by hard collisions? Uh, hard means, so we are, otherwise we are working at the hard tree limit, which is a singular self-energy term. So that does not cause any mode mixing. Ah. Uh, so it's not a collision of something uh, very uh, energetic particles. So this is something else. You, you can view it that in a way that we have introduced, uh, say, two loop diagram or, or, or three loop diagram involving uh, the scalar field and fermions or another scalar field, and we've taken the cut of that, which gives you the um, the collision in the the. the the sort of collision integral with a Boltzmann-like term, and then we have approximated that collision integral in the relaxation limit. Ah, okay. So in that sense, it's phenomenological, but I'm pretty sure that you can actually make this consistent. But I, I, I dare say I know so that you, you, you can find a sensible approximation to do this, for, mm -hmm. to, to do this starting from 2pi. Here, we just took some representative values for the C parameters. We took them to be constants. Of course, in, in reality, they are not in constant. They are also not constants, but some functions are. Okay. So I Thank you. continue now. Let's turn uh, Timo again for this very nice talk. And uh, I, and if you want to share the slides, so our next speaker is, is Dani Figueroa. That is gonna take, talk about this brand new lapis uh, code, Cosmo Lapis. They are simulating the other universe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me guys well? Can you see, see the screen? Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go straight to the point. Uh, in the early universe, uh, uh, understanding by that the very first second of the universe, including inflation, reheating, and the thermal era before BBM, there are a bunch of phenomena uh, from production of curvature uh, fluctuations to particle production, like what Kimo was describing, to phase transition, to cosmic defects. All of these phenomena are very different among themselves, but they share in common one particular aspect. They are all nonlinear field dynamics. They are characterized by nonlinearities in field theory, uh, which means uh, we typically need uh, numerics, precisely as uh, what Kimo was showing. And this doesn't concern only these uh, cases. It also goes uh, for the problem of computing gravitational wave production in the early universe, 
very often in biogenesis scenarios, magnetogenesis, primordial black hole formation, and even if we go beyond canonical cases, non-minimal gravitational coupling, non-minimal kinetic theories, or the study of turbulence and thermalization. Well, for all of these uh, cases, there is a new guy in town, it's called Cosmolaris. Uh, you know, it's my baby because it's taking me 10 years to arrive uh, into the final development. Uh, development. It came, of course, in collaboration with uh, a bunch of, uh, of friends and collaborators, and we released it with a, with a lattice theory uh, review, or in case you are interested in learning these techniques, and with a very long, lengthy manual, so you can learn all the steps, okay? Current version of Cosmolaris simulates a scalar and gauge dynamics, including U1 and SU2 interactions. It is written in a C++ modular structure, such that the physics is very separated from the technical details. Then uh, various uh, users with different uh, expertise can really uh, address the code uh, independently of what is your knowledge of, of technical details. For instance, the parallelization, which is done in multiple spatial dimensions, so you can send it into hundreds or thousands of uh, cores in a cluster. It's really hidden to you, and you will write everything in serial as close as possible to the continuum. And then we already provide a family of algorithms with various uh, accuracies. So essentially we are giving a very uh, prepared toolkit. Have a look in our website if you are interested where you can find all kinds of information uh, related to the code. What kind of uh, matter content uh, we can do, the, the actual uh, version of the code, we can deal with any scalar, real scalar sector, with any abelian gauge sector, uh, with any non-abelian SU2 uh, gauge sector, okay? Uh, I'm talking about uh, bosonic degrees of freedom, of course. And we can do that uh, uh, on top on an uh, expanding background, which actually we can self-consistency source by the actual energy density distributions or pressure density distribution by all these matter fields, okay? So we can do uh, the full evolution of the gravity part at the background level uh, together with all the homogeneous distribution of all these uh, matter field sectors. Uh, how the equations look like, uh, typically we adopt a Hamiltonian scheme uh, for a scalar field example. This is very simple to understand. You take a Klein Gordon equation, you define some um, clever conjugate momentum uh, related to the first derivative, and then you split the equation into, into one first order equations, the kick that evolves the, the conjugate momenta and the drift that evolves the amplitude of the field. We discretize our field variables in a lattice uh, that has same points per dimension as usual and a given lattice spacing uh, with periodic boundary conditions. This immediately imply there is a, an infrared minimum momentum you can have and a maximum ultraviolet momentum in any simulation. And for the gauge fields, we introduce them through links and uh, plaquettes, pretty much as uh, what people do in lattice QCD. But since that's pretty technical, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, if you work in something similar, you know what I mean. If you don't, uh, but you are curious, you can ask me later on. Uh, to solve the evolution of the universe, we, we use the acceleration equation, uh, which in this case has to be a source uh, in the right-hand side by the volume average of all kind of field contribution from kinetic uh, terms of all the scalar sectors, charge or not charge, from grad gradient terms of the scalar sectors, again, charge or not charge, potential, and then kinetic and gradient of the gauge sectors, uh, that is electric and magnetic field energy densities. And then we typically uh, monitor the accuracy of our algorithms by seeing how well the Hubble constraint uh, balances in the, in the evolution, or how, how well the, the Hubble rate is equal to the actual sum of all the energy densities. Typical outputs we can generate with the code uh, range from volume averages, for instance, of all the energy density components of your system to field spectra or other kind of spectra, which can be very useful, like occupation number and so on, and to uh, th three-dimensional or two-dimensional snapshots. And all of this is already uh, integrated in the code in such a way that you just choose a level and you say, I want to output three-dimensional distribution, and then you get it. You know, it's, it's really that simple. So Cosmolaris, uh, in summary, it's a code for field theories such that once you define your equations of motion and you can uh, put them in the system in a, in a correct lattice manner, and of course we've given already uh, many of these equations, but you can always look to, to put new ones, you define your initial conditions, and then you just have to choose what are your lattice parameters, 
what algorithm from the menu of algorithms you want to use to solve your equations and then fix your uh, strength of parameters, mass scales, etc. You choose what observables you want and you press play. It's really uh, that simple. And of course, the whole point of the code is not that we've given you the structure to do uh, some particular type of theories, is that cosmolaris really can be suitable for any new physical problem in field theory, as long as uh, you, know, you really uh, implement uh, the new equations within the language of cosmolaris. So it is really like a platform for field theories. And this is the way uh, or the take uh, home message that uh, you, you should really take uh, about cosmolaris. So far, uh, public version has global scalar dynamics, no matter complication of the potential, U1 scalar dynamics, SU2 scalar dynamics. But we are currently working, and actually we have implemented already gravitational waves from arbitrary sources from the field matters, action like couplings, uh, like to FF dual of any gauge sector, no minimal couplings to gravity, and cosmic string networks or other kind of defects. We will release these uh, new sub packages uh, next year. But as a matter of fact, um, since uh, many people were asking us all the time since last year, we've already released the gravitational wave uh, module for scalar sectors. So if you want to compute the gravitational waves from the early universe, from a scalar dynamics, uh, well, now you don't have any excuse because uh, <laughs> this is available there for free, okay? All right, now I'm gonna hit into the physics. I'm gonna go into the physics. Let me show you two examples. Uh, I could show you, of course, infinite number of examples, but uh, you know, for instance, one of the examples was the non-minimal gravitational coupling that I was, uh, telling Kimo about at the end of his talk. But uh, well, uh, I didn't decide uh, to cover that one today. I'm rather gonna cover these two other topics. The first one is particle coupling spectroscopy with gravitational waves. And the second one is the nonlinear field dynamics in action inflation, okay? So let me start with the first topic, uh, particle coupling reconstruction or spectroscopy with gravitational waves. This is in collaboration uh, with a former student at IPFL with Misha, Adrian Florio, my current student, Nicolas Loaiza, and uh, Mauro Pieroni, who is a postdoc in Imperial College. And the gravitational wave module was finished actually uh, together with Nico, with my other student, Jorge Baeza. Now, let me show you a basic example of uh, preheating since the organizers asked me to uh, talk a little bit about preheating. Imagine I, I take one of uh, Andre Linde's favorite models, uh, you know, of uh, alpha tractors. So a setup of a potential that flattens out large uh, field uh, values, you do inflation, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the field is rolling. And then we are gonna concentrate in the oscillations is gonna perform around a quadratic minimum because I'm choosing this minimum to be quadratic, okay? And now we couple the inflaton to some generic scalar field and we study the fluctuations of this scalar field. They are gonna have a time dependent mass just from the oscillations of the inflaton. And this is well-known story. It's been a study uh, forever, for decades, since the early nineties. Uh, the effect is parametric resonance. Uh, Kimo was already mentioning. And here is one example of a numerical outcome where we plot the power spectrum of the fluctuations uh, of you one of the mode functions of the, of the preheat field chi coupled to the inflaton. And the typical effect is that you have instabilities, the amplitude of the spectrum grows exponentially fast within the oscillations of the inflaton. And all of this happens in an infrared window, which eventually when the system becomes nonlinear, broadens up a little bit, but it still is all uh, infrared physics, short to say. Uh, this has been a study forever, uh, so let me uh, go into hitting uh, the point. The physics of preheating in general at the linear regime is about studying oscillator-like equa uh, equations with a mode a scale and time-dependent effective frequencies. Uh, these already give rise to non-perturbative and out-of-equilibrium physics, but more interestingly, uh, the systems are non-linear because fields are interacting, so at the end there is a mode coupling, because of the nonlinearity of the system. And this is all very interesting as we will see in a moment, no? Uh, all of these effects uh, of preheating typically happen in a specific range of momenta. 
that is the instabilities of the field fluctuations are only happening really uh, the exponential growth for a specific ranges of momenta, which means if you translate this into configuration real space, you are gonna get large inhomogeneities in your uh, field configuration. These are relativistic configurations uh, with a high energy density contrast. This is one example here where we plot uh, you know, the standard growth in tachyonic preheating of the Higgs-like field. And you see, we produce some uh, instabilities that uh, produce in configuration space, these kind of lamps. Eventually they also expand and they collide with other lamps and the whole system becomes very nonlinear, breaking up into a smaller structures. No? And this is when the, the system becomes uh, nonlinear. And this has been very well known for, for ages. Uh, to be a very efficient uh, gravitational wave generator, simply because we are talking about high energy density contrast uh, in homogeneities uh, propagating a relativistic space. No? Uh, this has been studied many times. Here are some of the original papers, and there's been many studies. Uh, the whole point I want to emphasize here is that because the system turns nonlinear, you need to resort to simulations. In my case, what I do is large simulations, okay? Different technique uh, than, than uh, chemo. Uh, for, again, I give you just the result because I want to hit into some new uh, message. For monomial potentials, like the ones I was showing, let it be quadratic, quartic, or whatever power law you want in the oscillations, the gravitational wave spectrum, which is by definition the energy density spectrum per logarithmic mode, uh, normalized to critical energy density, it has a single uh, bump for these kind of scenarios where we have a single preheat field. And the amplitude of this background of this spectrum of gravitational waves is basically controlled by the so-called resonance parameter, which codifies all the physics, the strength of the coupling, G, uh, the amplitude of the, of the inflaton at the onset of oscillations, and the effective frequency uh, curvature of uh, these oscillations in whatever the potential you choose. Uh, this uh, parameter really controls the amplitude of your final uh, background of gravitational waves and also controls the frequency, all right? So essentially, once you have a situation with a scalar field oscillating coherently, if it's coupled to some quantum field, you are gonna do parametric resonance, depends on the strength of the coupling, of course, and that's gonna lead to gravitation, to a gigantic gravitational wave production. And if you give us the coupling, the type of potential you have an initial amplitude, we can immediately predict what is the background looking uh, like uh, today. People have worked out uh, these scenarios for long, uh, the amplitude of these backgrounds can be really large today amount to uh, omega gravitational waves of order 10 to minus nine. It's a very, very large amplitude. But what I want to call your attention here is about uh, something that has not been explored before, which is the fact that since we know the parametrization of the background peak, as uh, we, we know how it depends on the coupling strength to the preheat field, the daughter field, and we know also the frequency, uh, how it depends on the coupling. Now the question is what happens if you add multiple species with different couplings? And in any case, any preheating scenario would naturally be engineered with multiple species like we have for example in the standard model or any beyond the standard model setup. So the question is, could we do a spectroscopy of particle couplings uh, with the signatures in the gravitational wave background? Okay, would we have different peaks? Well, let me give you a straight ahead the answer. Single peak signature for a given strength of coupling. It looks like this, the spectrum of gravitational waves. Now I choose another, the same scenario with a different preheat field, different strength, and I get another peak of gravitational wave. Well, what happens if I put these two preheat fields together in the same scenario? Well, you can guess right. What I get is a two peak signature in the gravitational wave background, which might have different heights, but uh, have absolutely the same positions as predicted by the original parametric resonance. And if I do multiple uh, species with different couplings, in this example, for instance, three, I do get a signature spectrum which has multiple peaks, as many as species I have in the gravitational wave spectrum. All right, so we call this the stairway signature. And essentially, now I'm gonna show you that if we use as a template uh, our, for instance, two peak uh, spectra, uh, uh, and we think there is a phenomena similar to the one I was simulating that give rise to a background with the same signature, for instance, at LISA uh, frequencies. Now I'm gonna inject that in the LISA simulator and I'm gonna reconstruct the double peak structure. I can totally do it with LISA and we've done some Fisher and Monte Carlo Markov chains and we can reconstruct the amplitude and position 
of the peaks to better than one percentage, which means we can really do the inverse engineering process such that by looking at the background gravitational waves, we can really deduce what is the strength of the interaction uh, of the preheat fields that created the gravitational waves. Of course, for the example I was showing you of preheating, uh, very unfortunately, even the amplitude is very large, the natural frequencies are high frequencies and there are no good detectors there. But what, I, what we want to show you here is just a proof of principle, okay? That uh, if one consider multiparticle species uh, systems, uh, what you are gonna get is situations like the one I was showing you, where we think we are gonna open a new door into doing particle physics, such that by using gravitational wave background reconstruction in the future, once we manage to measure any of these backgrounds, we'll be able to do particle physics in a similar, maybe not as good, but similar manner as in colliders. We do speak, uh, uh, we do expect multi-speak stairway signatures in low scale preheating scenarios, in phase transitions. And of course, we shouldn't neglect the possibility also of uh, eventually having high frequency uh, detectors, all right? Uh, now let me change uh, uh, to the second topic. Uh, here, I'm gonna change gear completely, not completely, completely, but uh, I'm gonna show you that the code is so powerful that we can also simulate uh, uh, very interesting stages of inflation. In particular, the nonlinear stages of action inflation where gauge fields uh, are very much excited. This is in collaboration with my Basque uh, team, uh, Johannes Lizarraga, uh, Ander Urio, who is a student of Lizarraga, and uh, John Urrestilla. Okay, action inflation is a very, very uh, simple scenario uh, where we invoke a shift symmetry such that we can build couplings of our uh, shift symmetric field into FF dual uh, operators of uh, any gauge sector. Uh, in this scenario of action inflation, of course, we break the shift symmetry by giving a potential, but uh, still it's a good idea to have uh, these interactions. And what I'm gonna show you is what's the consequence of having these interactions. Uh, just for the record, this is not the <laughs> Latin, the QCD action, okay? It's just an inflaton uh, action-like field. If you decompose into two elicities your abelian gauge field, assuming we focus in an abelian sector, you immediately discover that the two elicities are not the same because this coupling is chiral, okay? FF dual is chiral and differentiates the two elicities. So essentially one of them, in this choice, the A plus is gonna grow exponentially fast because it's gonna enjoy a tachyonic instability. And the whole effect is controlled by the side parameter, which depends on the velocity of the inflaton and the energy scale. Okay, and I get, I, I, I get, I, I, I guess you get immediately the idea by looking at the equation that there are instabilities. So the gauge fields are gonna grow exponentially fast, actually. There's gonna be huge particle production of these gauge fields during inflation. This has been a study forever in the last 10 years, and there are consequences when you mm, have uh, instabilities in a gauge sector like that. To begin with, you are gonna back react into the inflaton and you're gonna create non-Gaussian scalar perturbations. This is very simple to understand because the gauge fields are so excited, uh, they are gonna source inflaton perturbations through inverse decay, just this process, and these uh, are gonna be highly non-Gaussian uh, fluctuations. Uh, furthermore, because the gauge fields are so uh, largely excited, I'm gonna have non-trivial transverse traceless and electric and magnetic configurations of these gauge fields, and they are gonna source non-trivially gravitational waves. And the result, it's gonna be not only a very large background of gravitational waves coming from inflation are sourced by the gauge uh, fields, but also a chiral gravitational wave background which is something very, very special. Uh, now, these chiral gravitational waves, the whole effect is controlled by how much you uh, excite the gauge fields, which are very sensitive to the velocity of the inflaton, which is very sensitive to your choice of potential. Uh, in a few years ago paper by Balegui Dong and her collaborators, uh, here they show how sensitive the typical uh, energy density power spectrum of gravitational waves versus frequency today uh, changes depending on your choice of potential, all right? Uh, furthermore, uh, if we put together the fact that there are going to be non-scalar, sorry, non-Gaussian scalar perturbations and gravitational wave uh, altogether, uh, of course, the production of gravitational waves is going to be constrained by the fact that we cannot tolerate an overproduction of density perturbations. And this should be very clear because this side parameter that controls the whole excitation of the, of the gauge fields, it's going to evolve non-linearly during inflation. And if it grows too much, it will make the gauge fields to grow too much, 
and then you will produce an excess of primordial black holes. So you must have this under control. And uh, this is one example in which, for instance, for a monomial potential, uh, the PBAs, the primordial black hole bounds, prevent you from having gravitational waves uh, being observable. But all of these conclusions, all of these conclusions are based on analytical estimations. If I forget about those analytical estimations, like on the, on the non-Gaussianity of the scalar fluctuations or the uh, power spectrum of these scalar fluctuations, if I forget about them, the reality is these scenarios predict a gigantic background of gravitational waves. Here is the spectrum again versus frequency, which potentially could be directly observed by direct detection experiments like LISA. So my question now is, can we really detect this background, uh, which translates into, uh, can we really forget about the constraints that people have derived? And the problem I have with the constraints people have derived is that uh, in all of these, in primordial non-Gaussianity, gravitational wave and PBH, they are all based on certain analytical approximations or at least certain approximations. And to understand the severity of the difficulty of the problem, uh, let me uh, spell out the equations for you, the, the full system of equation. So introducing conjugate momentum for uh, inflaton, electric and magnetic fields, uh, conformal redefinitions of uh, conjugate momentum and electric field, and uh, defining the first derivative of the scale factor like this, the local equations of motion of the inflaton, including its uh, spatial dependencies and of the gauge fields are these ones, okay? And these are coupled system of equations. And on top of them, you have to solve, of course, the real time evolution of the Friedman equations uh, of, the, of the first derivative of the scale factor are sourced by the volume average of all the uh, kinetic potential electric and magnetic energy densities. Uh, this is extremely complicated uh, nonlinear system. Uh, this coupling, uh, for instance, the, the feedback of electric and magnetic configuration into the scalar sector uh, or the source of the gauge fields from the scalar sector makes completely nonlinear the system. So 10 years ago, when people realized how interesting the system is, they started with a linear regime. They eliminated all the, all the feedback and they just left the coupling of the magnetic field to the... To the scalar conjugate momentum. And uh, this is where they found that there is instability in the gauge fields. But uh, OK, let me put down these equations. But in reality, we know that the system is going to become nonlinear because you are exciting exponentially your gauge fields. So there's going to be a back reaction, clearly. And uh, that's the problem. You need to deal with this back reaction, this nonlinearity, if you really want to assess what are the real constraints. So the first approach that people took uh, like a few years ago was to take a homogeneous uh, approximation. So they uh, continue with the scalar sector, with the inflaton sector as being homogeneous, but now they take into account a back reaction from the produced uh, electric and magnetic uh, gauge fields configuration. Uh, this was done initially with analytical approximations, uh, but later on people turn into more complicated systems, decomposing this expectation value here and here for the feedback in the expansion of the universe into the integral over the spectra of the, of the mode functions of your gauge fields excited. And people develop complicated schemes uh, where you solve in Fourier space in a one dimensional grid of momenta, uh, your mode functions with the instability and every time a step you plug them in here, then you make one step of the evolution of a scale factor and a scalar sector. And uh, it turns out this is very elaborated, uh, but it works. It works pretty fine, but it is uh, still a homogeneous approximation. As we will see tomorrow, uh, recently other uh, group has developed actually a new technique to follow a certain set of equations, which corresponds to some expansion into correlators. And uh, also in the homogeneous approximation, they solve the system with the feedback within this approximation. And I believe um, uh, Sasha Sobols is gonna tell us about that tomorrow. So I'm not gonna say more, although I will do some small comparison later. Now, it is clear that if you want to solve this uh, really well, uh, you need to do it uh, in full detail, not just uh, making approximations. And in full detail means that we want to take into account the back reaction inhomogeneously. Okay, since the distribution of fields is homogeneous, which immediately implies that we also want to take the full inhomogeneity, restore it everywhere. Okay, include it uh, in the equation of motion of the gauge fields and in the 
and in the scalar field that now I will tolerate to have fluctuations. And of course, this system of equations, as I said from the beginning, is very difficult to solve, but here is where the lattice comes handy. The difficulty in the lattice approach is you need to choose a right uh, lattice approach, a, la, a right uh, lattice consistent discretization of your system or of equation. No? And it turns out that uh, Misha and myself, we found out this uh, scheme a few years ago for a completely different uh, problem. And uh, later on, I generalized the scheme for expanding background uh, together with a former uh, student, uh, master student in PFL. And uh, it's uh, lovely because now we, uh, it turns out that we already have the system of equations we want in the lattice. Uh, here is the equation of the inflaton dynamics. Here is the inflaton of the gauge field uh, dynamics. Uh, these are written in a complicated manner, technical manner, invoking uh, two uh, consecutive uh, plaquettes of electric fields, uh, four plaquettes all together for magnetic fields. I'm not going to enter into the technical details. I just want to tell you that our formulation, the one that Misha and I, we spell out originally, is lattice gauge invariant in the, at the lattice level. No, it respects, uh, it reproduces the continuum limit to uh, order dx squared, and it reproduces the Bianchi identities in the lattice. And more importantly, it uh, uh, respects exactly the shift symmetry on the lattice level. Okay, this is the importance of this formulation. And if you compare the, with equations of motion of the continuum that I was showing before, I just want to draw your attention that you see we, we do have terms reproducing the continuum everywhere. They look complicated. Well, you don't need to look into the, into the details because it doesn't matter. The point is we have them implemented now in Cosmolaris together with the expanding background, which you have to source with all the terms no, of, a, of energy densities from kinetic, electric, gradient, magnetic potential, etc. And then we can do the full nonlinear uh, evolution. Uh, it's true, we haven't been the first ones. There is an alternative lattice formulation uh, by Caravano et al, um, which have given some hints already in primordial non gaussianity analysis. And I believe uh, Kaloyan Losanov is going to talk about it later on. But in the last three minutes before I complete uh, half an hour, I'm going to show you our work in progress of how good we have under control these nonlinear dynamics. So, if the system were linear in the linear regime, meaning uh, everything is described by the scalar sector, the inflaton, eventually you slowly break a slow roll and eventually uh, epsilon parameter becomes one. We set up the zero uh, from linear analysis here in terms of a folding. And this would have been the end of inflation if uh, there was no uh, react here. So essentially they start affecting the dynamics, both of the expansion and of the inflaton and the breaking of a slow roll through a, a standard rolling of potential doesn't happen anymore. And then the epsilon parameter uh, oscillates and stacks around this value for a while, a couple of e folds, and eventually starts growing. But then this is now a growth dominated by the gauge field domination. And as you see, we gain extra four e folds compared to the counting of e folds if they had not been uh, gauge fields. So this really affects the dynamics of, of inflation. Uh, if we look at the equation of a state, uh, this looks very similar to previous uh, plot. We see again, once the system back reacts, the gauge field production, then the nonlinearities kick in and we see the extra uh, 40 folds until the equation of a state becomes minus one third, which signals the end of inflation. How does it look at the spectral level? Uh, the gauge uh, field spectrum, it's such that if we plot the unstable mode, uh, here the, the A plus uh, polarization, we start in Vance Davis, uh, 60 folds before the end of linear inflation, let me call it like that, and you see the exponential growth. The fields are becoming absolutely classical. You know, it's an exponential growth for this choice of, uh, of coupling, by the way. Uh, now, However, when we plug in the nonlinearity, the full system of equations, we see that at the would be zero folding of the linear system, the excitation has already different orders of magnitude from the would be uh, linear physics. And that's because at some moment back reaction had started and now the would be end of linear inflation, uh, it gives us uh, excitation here, which means now we have to continue inflation, but dominated by a mixture of gauge fields and uh, scalar fields. And this is the previous line. Now I change color coding. We get the extra I foldings. And essentially, the gauge fields continue growing exponentially fast because they are still uh, feeling the, the, the chiral instability. 
and uh, you see it's amazing because they become even more uh, macroscopic, more, more classical. And furthermore, because this is a lattice simulation where we have under control all the degrees of freedom, not only the A plus the unstable mode I can show you, I can show you also the A minus, which doesn't suffer the chiral instability, but uh, towards the end it gets excited. Uh, here is in the dots. So the total answer for back reaction actually goes to the dash, which is the total gauge fields with both, both chiralities, which again changes slightly uh, the back reaction. Uh, the energy densities, uh, for instance, uh, here I'm plotting kinetic potential and electromagnetic energy densities. If we were in the linear regime, uh, the electromagnetic gauge fields energy density will grow with instability unbounded and the potential would slowly go down as the kinetic energy of the inflaton goes up and then you break a slow roll here. But that's not what happens. We go to non-linearities, kinetic energy gets damped and the gauge fields grow exponentially fast until back reaction hits and then they stop that growth, although they continue towards the end, driving the end of inflation. Uh, to finish, uh, let me show you the evolution of the side parameter. Remember, this parameter controls uh, all the phenomena, all the physical interesting phenomena in the linear setup. It would have gone this way until the end of inflation. It turns out that once nonlinearity is hit in, it uh, stops growing. It actually oscillates and uh, it goes this way in the extra e folding uh, we have for, of inflation. And as I said before, uh, there are previous studies uh, with a complicated system of iterative uh, system of equations uh, with homogeneous approximation by Balegui, uh, Donk, and Gorbar et al. And they have very uh, similar results despite that they use uh, uh, very different techniques. But uh, here we show that in the lattice, once we do the full nonlinear locality, uh, the, the evolution of size is slightly different. And I'm afraid this is crucial because psi controls the gauge field excitation. Any linear change in psi, as small as it is, it goes exponentially the response into the gauge field excitation and hence all predictions and constraints from primordial non-gaussianity in this system to primordial black holes to gravitational waves, they all depend crucially of following exactly psi, which means that now we have the tools to completely reassess the real observability of this. We can even add swinger per production easily through this effective uh, uh, equation and study other phenomena like baryogenesis in these scenarios, magnetogenesis, etc. And I hope uh, this will be soon in the archive. Sorry, I, it took me a bit long, Javi. Uh, I hope I'm more or less on time. Uh, to know more about Cosmolatis, here you have uh, our website. And before uh, I, I uh, thank you for your attention, let me give just a 30 seconds message, Javi. Uh, in, uh, in September, this September, we're gonna organize a summer school because yes, guys, in September in Spain, it will continue being summer. And uh, uh, it's gonna be uh, in person in Valencia. And you know, Valencia is a beautiful city as you can see by my background here. And you are very welcome from uh, master students to senior people to join if you want to learn how to do uh, these kind of simulations, please visit uh, this uh, website for the school. Thank you very much, sorry, I'm a bit late. Thank you very much, Sonny, for this very complete talk. Uh, questions. I see Kohei already has a question. Please be concise and also the answer. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. So I'm interested in the in here about the Ching effect in models. So I feel that you have something in mind the uh, in this current uh, that so the the sigma uh, or electric conductivity is you 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 have something in mind analytic calculation of the electric conductivity it could be implemented, but the all the single effect electric conductivity is given by in the, the in the assumption that the homogeneous electric and magnetic field. So the in, in the more precise, I would expect that you can you the electric conductivity it's or in this current should be calculated by self consistently in your in your, your lattice sim code. So how is it possible or how do you think about that? Uh Kohei, thank you for the question. Uh to be honest, we haven't really thought about that uh, yet. Uh, so I cannot give you any concrete answer. I know there are few studies, uh, the state of the art uh, by various people, including Balegui and her collaborators, yeah. various people at CERN and so on. Uh, they have uh, used this approximation you were mentioning, and they are computing typically the conductivity for uh, exactly the sitter, I think, uh, in certain approximation. I don't know what level of approximations I will have to deal with, but the advantage of the lattice, Kohei, is typically 
that even if you have integral expressions as a function of other fields, you can include it, you know? So uh, I really hope we'll be able to give the best uh, 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 approach possible. But to be honest, I haven't thought about that yet, so I cannot uh, really comment on, on the problem. Thanks. So in, in that case, I, I would expect that uh, in, instead of adding the electric conductivity, but just add new 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 charged particle in your let's call, so that the induced current is automatically. Yeah, yeah, but we want to describe uh, fermions like that, you know, and I cannot yeah. just add fermions into a classical simulation, okay? So it's not that simple, you know? Uh, uh, I cannot okay. add directly fermions like that. So okay. this is why this is a good trick. Uh, but the, the various steps into approximating the reality, <laughs> I will have to think about it once I approach the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far, far, yeah I agree that far, first step would be the, the analytic estimate for the electric conductivity to implement here. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, good, thanks. I will talk to you when in due time. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, next question in line, Andre, please. Yeah, thanks for the talk. So going back to preheating. So if I replace the input on potential from tanh squared to something like tanh to the fourth, uh, yes. can I still handle it with cosmolattice? Absolutely, of course, why not? <laughs> you can handle any potential you want, Andre, uh, even fractional power there if you want. You know, you, you can put whatever you want uh, because in these preheating scenarios, uh, sorry, this is taking time to think. Uh, uh, these preheating scenarios, at the end of the day, all we are simulating is the oscillations here. So, well, I actually see Mustafa Amin uh, connected. He's done a lot of simulations of this kind, you know, with uh, this uh, potential with various powers here. So, yes, you can do it. We've done it actually for multiple other problems. Uh, but for this particular study of gravitational wave production of the stairway signature, uh, we just choose the, the simplest case, you know, but uh, you can do lambda phi to the fourth, lambda phi to the three with the uh, modulus of the field, lambda phi to the 2.3, if you want, you know, it's not a problem. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Okay, okay, thanks. No problem. And you will get similar effect, I'm pretty sure, for the stairway uh, signature. Uh, at the end of the day, the whole point is that there's parametric resonance and the details of parametric resonance are just codified here, you know, but... Uh, you will still get uh, these kind of uh, signatures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mustafa Amin, there was a question for you, Dani. Hey, Dani, uh, really nice talk. Um, I had, so first, by the way, thanks for saying I did the simulations. Of course I didn't, it was Carlo N, uh, who's gonna <laughs> tell us about it next. Uh, but uh, the other part I was gonna ask you is, do you have any um, plans of including uh, gravitational clustering into the code, uh, dynamical gravity into the code, not just uh, output in the near future? Uh, so you would, you mean like a general relativity code uh, set of equations? Uh, That's, I mean, linear, we can do, linearized gravity is okay. As yeah. long as there's Newtonian clustering of fields, uh, that's also okay. It doesn't have to be fully general relativity. I mean, not yeah. fully yeah. Linear linearized gravity, gravity. I'm already working on that for the scalar potentials. Yes, it's a natural uh, thing to put and it's uh, trivial actually. It's just, uh, I have so many projects right now that I put that one a bit aside, but uh, uh, yes, yes, we have that. And uh, there was some discussion with Tom Giblin last year, uh, uh, whether eventually we would want to migrate uh, GR equations uh, here, you know, which would be a possibility. Because, you know, the, the, the whole point of Cosmolaris is that one should look at it not at a code that does a specific set of equations, but really uh, as a platform where uh, if you implement whatever set of equations, then we already have the algorithms there in place to solve them, you know, and the observables and so on. So typically it doesn't matter how complicated the equations are because we have all kinds of algorithms to solve whatever nonlinearities, including non-canonical uh, kinetic terms, non-canonical uh, interactions, etc. You know. Of, of course, depending on the interaction, if it's very non-canonical, very non-linear, you may be in trouble with the, the chosen algorithm and you may want to refine that algorithm or the time step, etc. cetera, no? the, the usual game you always have to play. You know? But uh, uh, it would be nice, uh, Mustafa, I, I know you've been working on that uh, quite a bit. It'd be nice if uh, uh, you would like to join us and maybe go for the scalar uh, fluctuation uh, implementation here at some point.
Sebastian? Yeah, so, so very short, so you almost said it already. What are the prospects for a non-canonical kinetic term of, of, the, influ uh, of, of the scalar field? The prospects are uh, the algorithm to solve, to solve that kind of equations. Is the is is the kind of algorithm we use to solve the phi sorry the the phi square r uh, system of equations, which is the so-called non-symplectic integrators that are capable of integrating when you have a very strong nonlinearity in the system and you cannot split into this Hamiltonian form so easily. Uh, it works beautifully. Runge Kuta are one example of this. Okay, uh, Runge Kuta are of various uh, uh, approaches. Uh, uh, since I believe you know. Uh, um, Adrian Florio, uh, he has already implemented them. They work beautifully for uh, uh, phi square r. They work beautifully for phi ff dual. We haven't just tried them in uh, no minimal uh, kinetic terms, but I don't see any reason why they shouldn't work, you know, uh, because uh, the algorithms work by themselves. So we just haven't tried them. Yeah, so the technical follow-up. So the, uh, the, the non-minimal coupling, the xi phi squared r, do you do it in Jordan or Einstein frame? In the Jordan frame. Of course, we can do in the Einstein frame, as everybody does, because is, from a lattice point of view, there is no difficulty to do in the Einstein frame. Okay? The difficulty was to do it in the Jordan frame, and this is where we cook a new algorithm uh, to, to solve it. You know? and okay. Soon enough, we will compare the outcome of the two in explicit example, which is geometric preheating. Is the one I was uh, telling Kim about. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we can go for a very short question by Hori Seppur. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Oh. Uh, I, I have a short question. I want to know if there is any algorithm in, your, in um, uh, Cosmolatis to, uh, to calculate uh, differential integral. integral um, equations, because especially as you see in the previous talk, in, in um, uh, 2 PI uh, method, there are a lot of uh, differential integral integral um, uh, equations. Therefore, I don't know if, if it, it is, um, I mean, your code. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, integral differential equations are trivial from the uh, point of view of the structure of the, of the algorithm. So the algorithms are the same. The difficulty of integral differential equations, uh, like the ones Kimo was showing, is particularly when they have memory, okay, uh, is that you need a lot of uh, time to evolve them and you need uh, a lot of uh, memory if you have to store the previous evolution of the fields. So for instance, with a typical uh, 2PI scheme where you have memory from the past, you would have to set up new variables that store the integration from the previous uh, past and then uh, to include that in every new step. And this costs uh, memory and time. Uh, but from the point of view of the algorithms, there is nothing new. It's just about implementing in your set of equations that every step you have to add up the integral, uh, integral uh, contribution, which takes time you know, and memory. OK, thank you. Uh, so we are running a bit out late, so I will suggest uh, to postpone the question to the next uh, session. But it's also going to be talking about lattice simulations in inflation and heating. So let me thank Danny again for this nice talk. And uh, welcome Kaloya Lozano for this talk about uh, lattice simulations of inflation and reheating. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, let me begin with my presentation. So, yeah, uh, hello everybody. My name is Koyao Zanov and I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today I'll be talking about uh, my works in the context of inflation and cosmology. We will briefly touch upon topics like reheating after inflation and phenomenology of gauge fields during and after inflation. Okay, so let's begin with a series of studies of the equation of state of the universe soon after the end of inflation. So what is the equation of state after inflation? To answer this question, we study the post-inflation expansion history of the universe in single field models with infoton potential of the following form, some parallel near the minimum and appropriate flattening away from it to be consistent with observations. There is also a short list of references to works which also provide the theoretical motivation for this form of the infoton potential. 
For any such info tone potential, there are only two relevant features, the power n near the minimum and the scale m where the potential starts to flatten. Um, while we allow ourselves for quite general shapes of the infotone potential, we limit ourselves to the cases where the self-couplings of the infotone dominate over its couplings to other fields. So within this framework, we find the following very simple answer to a question. We find that at sufficient late times, the equation of state is zero if n is one or 30 if n is greater than one. Note that we can achieve radiation elimination easily, even without coupling the infotone to additional light fields. And in the rest of this first part of the talk, I'll try to briefly explain the independence of this result from the value of the scale m, the special nature of n equal to one, and the generic behavior for n greater than one. Note that n need not be an integer. Okay, so let's begin with the dynamics of the infotone. We adopt the standard picture in which after the end of slower inflation, the infotone begins to oscillate about the bottom of its potential. If we assume that the infotone remains homogeneous, uh, the amplitude of its oscillations decay with time or scale factor in the usual manner. Uh, we can then turn our attention to the equation of state parameter W, defined as the ratio of the pressure and energy density, written out explicitly here. And given all that, we can calculate the mean equation of state during the oscillatory stage. Here's the expression n minus 1 over n plus 1. It's a well known result. And its only requirement is for the infotone to remain homogeneous while oscillating. And what we show in our work is that the homogeneous assumption may not always hold. Instead, instead we show that the oscillations of the infotone condensate can resonantly or non perturbatively amplify its own spatial homogeneities, eventually leading to its complete fragmentation, as shown in the video. As you can see, the actual dynamics can be highly nonlinear very different from the homogeneous case. And the question is, how does all of this affect the equation state? So here shown the evolution of the equation state for two different values of the power n, n equal to one on the left and some value of n greater than one on the right. On the vertical axis, we have the equation of state parameter W. And on the horizontal axis, we have the number of faults of expansion after the end of inflation delta big n. So time runs, as usual, from left to right in both plots. In blue, we have the expected homogeneous equation of state. And in black, we have the equation of state for radiation domination. The radiation equals one third. And now in orange and green, we give the actual evolution of the equation of state. The data is from representative flight simulations. In orange, we have the equation of state for a case when the scale m is much less than m Planck, and in green when the scale m is comparable to m Planck. In the orange case, we say that the resonance is efficient since it leads to a complete fragmentation of the infotone condensate within less than any fault after the end of inflation. Afterwards, W quickly settles to zero if n is one or a third if n is greater than one. On the other hand, in the green case, we say that the resonance is inefficient since the condensate can oscillate for very long times. In fact, if n is one, the condensate never fragments due to self-resonance, whereas if n is greater than one, the condensate eventually fragments and W quickly settles to one third almost in a step-like manner. Um, as you can see, there is a number of different regimes, different scenarios. So now we will consider each one of these in turn very briefly. So let's begin with the radiation elimination cases corresponding to n greater than one. Uh, let's start with the linear regime during which the oscillations of the infotone condensate can resonantly or non-perturbatively amplify its own spatial homogeneities. Here shown the real part of the flock exponent characterizing the particle production rate as a function of the amplitude of infotone oscillations and the dimension is wave number kappa. Little m, the effective mass, is defined down here. In the figure, you can see a broad low momentum instability band and a series of narrow bands going all the way to the bottom of the chart. Um, the expansion of the universe can be incorporated qualitatively. Recall that in an expanding universe, the amplitude of infotone oscillations decays with time or scale factor the dimension of physical wave number kappa also varies with scale factor. Hence, a given coming mode flows across this chart as time goes by and the universe expands. Now, if we set the scale m to be comparable to m Planck, the amplitude of infotone oscillations gets redshifted very quickly as time goes by and the universe expands. And only the first now instability band at the bottom of the chart is expected to play a major role. Since a given coming mode will be redshifted very quickly towards the bottom and will cross the first narrow band from right to left. We expect to see significant particle production 
in a narrow comic band whose peak shifts with time towards higher comic wave numbers. Let's consider the actual evolution of the infoton power spectrum. The data I'm about to show you is from a representative flight simulation capturing the nonlinear dynamics of the infoton and the expansion of the universe in the background level. So indeed, initially, we observe particle production in a narrow combing band whose peak shifts with time towards higher combing wave numbers. This is followed by the generation of a series of secondary peaks due to nonlinear scattering. The growth is eventually shut off by back reaction and fragmentation. The peaks smear out, and at late times, power cascades slowly towards the UV and the field is virilized and evolves in a turbulent like manner. So, as you can see, our light simulations confirm the qualitative predictions from our analysis. However, they also give us some extra information since they capture the full nonlinear dynamics. Okay, now let's increase the value of the power n from 1.5 to 2. The Floquet chart remains qualitatively the same. We still have a broad low momentum stability band and a series of narrow bands going all the way to the bottom. The expansion of the universe can be again incorporated qualitatively. This time we end up with vertical flow lines. This is because the product of the scale factor and little m, the effective mass, is approximately constant for a quartic minimum. And again, if we set the scale to be comparable to M Planck, the amplitude of fifth oscillations gets redshifted very quickly as time goes by and the universe expands. And again, only the first narrow band at the bottom plays a, an important role. Since this time, combing modes flow vertically downwards, we expect to see significant particle production in a narrow combing band whose peak does not shift sideways. The narrow peak in the infoton power spectrum should stay fixed in combing space. Our LAT simulations again verify this prediction. Here, the vertical dash line lies in the middle of the first narrow band. And indeed, initially observed particle production in a narrow combing band whose peak does not shift sideways. This is followed by the generation of a series of secondary peaks due to nonlinear scattering. And the growth is eventually shut off by back reaction and fragmentation. And the peaks smear out and power cascades slowly towards the UV. Okay, now let's increase the value of the power end further from two to three for one last time, I promise. Uh, the Floki chart remains qualitatively the same. We still have the broad low momentum band and the series of narrow bands going all the way to the bottom of the chart. The expansion of the universe can be again incorporated qualitatively. This time we end up with such flow lines. And again, if we set the scheme to be comparable to M Planck, again, the amplitude gets redshifted quickly. And again, only the first now band at the bottom plays a major role. Since this time, a coming mode will be redshifted very quickly towards the bottom and will cross the first now band from left to right. We expect to see significant particle production in a narrow coming band whose peak shifts with M towards lower coming wave numbers. Um, this is indeed confirmed by our LAT simulations. Indeed, initially, we observe particle production in a narrow combing band whose peak shifts with time towards lower combing wave numbers in agreement with our qualitative linear analysis. Uh, this again eventually followed by a generation of a series of secondary peaks due to nonlinear scattering. Here it is. And the growth is eventually shut off by back reaction and fermentation. Okay, now. Let's keep the value of the power n fixed equal to three, and let's set the scale m to be much less than m Planck. In this case, the amplitude of infant oscillations gets redshifted very slowly as time goes by and the universe expands. And we expect the broad low momentum instability band to play a major role. Since this time, combing modes flow very slowly along the flow lines, we're essentially stuck somewhere up here in the chart. We expect to see significant particle production in a broad combing band. Let's see what our LAT simulations actually give us. Indeed, initially we observe particle production in a broad combing band. The growth is rapidly shut off by back reaction fragmentation. However, the broad peak stays there for some time, even after back reaction fragmentation, but eventually goes away. And at late times, power again cascades slowly towards the UV and the field is realized and turbulent. So what's happening here? Why do we have this broad peak in the power spectrum staying there for some time, even after back reaction fragmentation, but eventually going away. And also what's happening with the other power spectrum? Well, for them much less than M Planck case, the case on the left and the case I just showed you, the infoton forms highly over dense field configurations, which can dominate the energy density. However, these are of transient nature. They decay away quickly, as you can see in the video. leaving behind them a completely fragmented infoton field. And that's why the broad peak in the power spectrum eventually went away. And at late times, we find numerically that the field is realized, evolves in a turbulent-like manner, 
and most importantly, has kinetic and gradient energies approximately equal to each other and much greater than the potential energy, implying a radiation-like equation of state. On the other hand, for the M comparable to M plan case, the case on the right, and the case for the other power spectra, we observe slow but steady particle production due to a first now instability band, eventually linked to a complete fragmentation of the infoton condensate. However, this time without the formation of any transient or dense field configurations. But again, at sufficient eight times, we find that, <clears throat> that the field is realized, evolves in a turbulent like manner, and most importantly, has kinetic and gradient energies approximately equal to each other and much greater than the potential energy, again, implying a radiation like equation of state. So, as you can see, no matter what the value of the scale m is in terms of M Planck, we always end up with the radiation like equation of state as long as the power n is greater than one. Note that we can achieve radiation elimination <coughs> easily, even without coupling the infoton to additional light fields. This simple result can significantly bound the expansion history of reheating, and this bound can be then transferred on predictions for CMB observables, such as the spectral index NS and the tensor to scalar ratio R. Let me explain what I mean by that. In any of these two parameter models of inflation, NS and R depend only on the values of the scale M, power N, and N star. N star is the usual number of faults of expansion before the end of inflation, when cosmological ground perturbations crossed outside the Hubble radius. Typically, the value of N star is quite uncertain. The uncertainty comes from the fact that we don't know how long it took the universe to make the transition between the end of inflation and radiation illumination. Just to get some idea about the uncertainties in N star, here's the typical range that is common used to account for these reheating rate uncertainties. And based on our analysis, the uncertainties in N star can be reduced significantly. Let's see how this happens. Here's the full expression used to calculate N star. Only the last term depends on the expansion history of reheating. Our analysis allows us to calculate delta big N radiation the number of faults of expansion between the end of inflation or the ancient elimination. We know from our analysis how long it takes for an isolated infoton to fragment and reach radiation elimination. Here's the expression. Now, if we allow for coupling some infoton to additional light fields, delta N radiation can be only reduced. Hence, this expression should be taken as an upper bound on delta N radiation. Our analysis also allows us to calculate the mean equation of state between the end of inflation and radiation elimination. Uh, here's how the equation state actually varies. To a very good approximation, it evolves in a step-like manner. Our LAT simulations have verified that. So using these results, we can now calculate the expected values for NS and R for different values of the scale M and power N, even accounting for uncertainties due to couplings of the infoton to additional light fields. So let's consider some specific models. Let's start with the popular alpha tractor T models in which the infoton potential profile goes as tanch raised to some power. Here are our predictions for R and NS for this. Uh, here are our predictions for R and NS for three different values of the power N given with these three thick red, orange, and green lines. The width of each line corresponds to the uncertainties due to couplings of the infoton to additional light fields. And now for comparison, we give the standard predictions for R and NS with these three broad red, orange, and green bands. The width of each band corresponds to the standard reheating rate of surface. So as you can see, our analysis can help reduce the uncertainties in predictions for R and NS from the standard row bands to the thick lines that we have. Let's change the potential. Our analysis also applies to asymmetric potential profiles. So let's consider the alpha tractor E models in which the potential profile goes like that. Again, our predictions without uncertainties, standard predictions, standard uncertainties. Again, the uncertainties in predictions for R and NS can be reduced substantially from the standard row bands to the thick lines that we have. Our results can be also applied to parallel potential profiles. So let's consider a monodromy-like potential, which goes as phi raised to some power q far away from the minimum. We can set q to one half, for example, so the slower inflation is realized by square root of phi. Again, our predictions with uncertainty, standard predictions, standard uncertainties, and the bottom line is that our analysis can help reduce the uncertainties in predictions for R and NS from the standard row bands to the thick lines that we have. Okay, now let's move on quickly to the matter domination cases corresponding to n equal to one, or in other words, to quadratic minima. Most people may say that these are the most natural cases since most minima in nature are quadratic. Um, here, the Floquet chart 
does not remain qualitatively the same. While we still have a broad low momentum instability band, we do not have a series of narrow instability bands going all the way to the bottom of the chart. In fact, there are no instability bands at the bottom of the chart, since there we have a free theory, an m squared phi squared theory, and we don't expect to see any instabilities due to nonlinear interactions. Uh, the expansion of the universe can be again incorporated qualitatively. And if we again set the scale M to be comparable to M Planck, again, the amplitude of fifth oscillations gets redshifted very quickly. And uh, since combing modes get redshifted very quickly towards the bottom of the chart, and there are no instability bands at the bottom of the chart, we don't expect to see significant particle production. Our lot simulations confirm this qualitative prediction. Initially, we observe some particle production. However, the growth is rapidly shut off by the expansion of the universe. And uh, at late times, there aren't enough particles to cause any back reaction, and the infoton condensate remains intact. Now, if we set the scale M to be much less than M Planck, the amplitude of infoton oscillations gets redshifted very slowly, and we expect the broad low momentum band to play a major role. Since this time, coming modes flow very slowly, we're essentially stuck somewhere up here in the chart. We expect to see significant particle production in a broad common band. Let's see what our lot simulations actually give us. Indeed, initially, initially we observe particle production in a broad common band. The growth is rapidly shut off by back reaction fragmentation. However, the broad peak in the power spectrum stays there for the entire duration of the simulation. It never goes away. It only gets slowly shifted towards higher common wave numbers as time goes by and the universe expands. So what's happening here? Why do we have this broad peak in the power spectrum staying there for the entire duration of the simulation, never going away? And also what's happening with the other power spectrum? Well, for them, much less than m Planck case, the case on the left and the case I just showed you, the photon forms highly over dense field configurations known as oscillons. You can think of oscillons as solitons, very long-lived, very stable objects. They never decay for duration of our lot simulations. That's why the broad peak in the power spectrum never went away. And since oscillons are very stable and behave as pressureless dust, they can lead to long periods of matter dominated state of expansion. On the other hand, for the M comparable to M Planck case, the case on the right, and the case for the other power spectrum, the particle production is inefficient. It is shut off by the expansion of the universe um, before it can cause any back reaction. So in this case, the infoton condensate remains intact and keeps oscillating about the quadratic mu of its potential, again, implying a matter-like equation state. So as you can see, no matter what the value of the scale m is in terms of m Planck, we always end up with a matter-like equation state as long as the power n is exactly equal to one, as long as we have a quadratic mu. So in these cases, in order to ensure the eventual approach to radiation domination and the successful completion of reheating, we need to explicitly introduce couplings of the infoton to additional light fields. And here I've tried to add at least some references to works which uh, consider very natural couplings between the infoton and light daughter fields. Um, <clears throat> our simple self resonance scenario can have a number of other observational consequences. For instance, we can get stochastic gravitational waves out of the formation of the uh, out of the fragmentation of the infoton condensate. Um, here shown the evolution of the gravitational wave power spectrum during and after the formation of infoton oscillons. Uh, time runs from red to purple. On the vertical axis, we have the gravitational wave energy density normalized by the critical energy density of the universe today. On the horizontal axis, we have the frequency of the gravitational wave signal again evaluated today. This plot is for the alpha tractor T models. So the infoton potential is time squared. And please note the prominent peak in the gravitational wave power spectrum. Here's the same plot, but for the transient objects, the objects we get when the infoton potential minimum is not quadratic, but something steeper. This particular figure is for a quartic minimum, again, for the alpha tractor T models. So the infoton potential here is touched to the fourth. And again, please note the prominent peak in the gravitational wave power spectrum. We have a very good parametric understanding of the location of this peak, basically of its mean frequency and height. And here shown the full range of gravitational waves we can get out of the formation of the infoton oscillons. We cannot get any further to the left in this figure um, unless we assume that the oscillon scalar field is not the infoton field, but some other spectator field. Basically for the infoton, the parametric resonance here is inefficient. It is shut off by the expansion of the universe before it can cause any back reaction. However, this is not necessarily the case for a spectator field. On the other hand, we cannot get any further to the right in this figure, since here, 
the field modes which get resonantly amplified have initial energies, vacuum energies, already comparable or even greater than the background energy. This bound is quite hard. It cannot be overcome even if we assume a spectator field in, instead of the infoton field to play the role of the Ocean scale field. In fact, this bound is quite generic. It applies to all sorts of reheating scenarios featuring the resonant amplification of field modes, not necessarily scalar fields, but also gauge fields, fermionic fields, etc. But still, there is some hope left for observations. These bounds are derived under the assumption of the immediate onset of radiation domination after osteon formation. If we assume something faster than radiation domination, say matter domination, then these bounds get translated in this direction. And if we assume something slower than radiation domination, say kination domination, then these bounds get translated in this direction. And of course, the amount of translation depends on the details of the expansion history between osteon formation and the eventual onset of radiation domination. Another interesting application of our simple self resonance scenario is to some new early dark energy models meant to resolve the so called Hubble tension. These scenarios assume an ocean the scalar about the parallel minimum. And uh, Mustafa, Tristan Smith, and I have been looking into the nonlinear dynamics of this early dark energy field. Um, on the other hand, if we make the infoton field a complex scalar, the oscillons we observe can decay into cubos, which are infinitely stable and therefore can serve as dark matter candidates. If we further slightly break the global U1 symmetry of the complex scalar, we can get biogenesis. In this broad class of biogenesis models, the nonlinear dynamics at the end of inflation can generate an asymmetry between the number of infotons and anti-infotons. And this asymmetry can be then transferred into the observed baryon asymmetry in our universe today if we simply allow for the infotons to decay into baryons at some point after inflation. And the other works of mine I want to mention very briefly are on gauge fields during inflation and reheating. Um, in this particular work, we study the evolution of abelian and non-abelian gauge fields and metric perturbations during inflation and preheating. So we basically carried out the linear analysis in models with a charged infoton. Such models are well motivated since such interactions appear in the standard model itself. Uh, the analysis of resin particle production during preheating is slightly more complicated than the one the usual scalar field models of preheating, since here we have to worry about additional gauge constraints. But still, we managed to carry out the stability analysis, the flock analysis, and we showed for the first time that both transfers and longitudinal gauge field modes can be resonantly amplified at similar rates. Um, currently, I'm developing a lattice code to study the subsequent nonlinear dynamics after back reaction. Here is one of my runs in which I show the formation of cosmic strings from preheating. The abelian version of the code is called um, GFIRE. It was released a little over a year ago. It has a number of novel unique features. Basically, once you see the algorithm, all your hopes and dreams will come true. So please check it out. And currently, we're trying to extend the abelian version of the code to study non abelian problems, such as non abelian backgrounds during inflation, which are known to give rise to non trivial tensor metric perturbations and strong tensor non gaussianities. And on this project, I've been co collaborating over the years with many people, including my including with my PhD advisor, as well as my previous employer, Chiro Kumatsu, and uh, other people from Munich. Um, and another natural gauge field model of inflation involves some axion-like field coupled to a U1 abelian gauge field. In this broad class of models, the axion-like field plays the role of the infoton. It has a <coughs> slowly rolling background, which drives inflation, and a perturbation, which gives rise to the courage perturbation we observe in the CMB. Uh, what about the gauge fields? Well, the effective coupling between the gauge fields and the axion-like infoton is captured. Thank you. Yeah. And the effective coupling between the gauge roots and the axion like infoton is captured by the dimensionless parameter xi. Xi is uh, determined by the coupling constants appearing in the Lagrangian and the background quantities. Depending on the value of xi, we can have two interesting regimes. If xi is a further one or slightly greater than one, uh, the gauge fields are weakly but non-negligibly coupled to the axiom infoton. 
On the other hand, if Xi is much greater than UAT, the gauge roots are strongly coupled to the inflow plane. In the former case, we say that we're in the regime of weak gauge root back reaction. And in the latter case, we say that we're in the regime of strong gauge root back reaction. And since the original works on this um, interesting gauge root model of inflation, the two back reaction regimes have been studied at increasingly higher level of uh, increasing higher levels of refinement. So there is a vast perturbation literature studying the effects of the gauge roots on the inflaton background. And a huge part of this perturbation literature also studies the effects of the gauge roots on the inflaton perturbation. Uh, here, the inflaton perturbation is captured by the gauge invariant courage perturbation zeta. Uh, zeta to leading order in slow row in the spatially far gauge is given by this expression. And in our work, we revisit the problem of uh, gauge root back reaction on the axion like infoton using non perturbative classical lattice simulations. And before I present the results from our uh, lattice simulations, I would like to draw your attention to the leading author of our papers, Andrew Carvano, who is a PhD student at LMU in Munich, as well as at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching. Uh, Andrew did the hard work for our projects. He did the numerical and analytical computations, and he was also in charge of writing the papers. So Angelus simulations are initialized deep within the inflationary era. Uh, for example, 60 folds before the end of inflation, and they capture the subsequent five to 60 folds of expansion before they run out of spatial resolution. So now let's consider with the lattice results for the gauge root back reaction on the infoton background. Uh, in the weak back reaction regime, the infoton background is virtually unaffected by the gauge roots. Uh, as in agreement with the uh, analysis uh, from the perturbation theory. Uh, so just like in the single field slow roll cases, uh, the infoton background gradually speeds up its slow roll due to the slope of its potential and the gauge roots play no role. On the other hand, in the strong gauge root back reaction regime, the evolution of the infoton background is significantly affected by the gauge roots. Initially, the effective coupling grows with time, and there is significant production of gauge particles. At intermediate times, the gauge particles back react on the infoton condensate and slow it down. The coupling becomes weak and the production of gauge particles is stopped. In the meantime, the energy of the available gauge particles gets redshifted away. And at later times, the back reaction is also stopped. And afterwards, the infoton is free to start speeding up its slow roll again, and the whole process repeats. Okay, now let's move on to the effects of the gauge roots on the infoton perturbations. Let's begin with the infoton power spectrum, which is captured by the gauge variant curvature. So it turns out that even in the weak back reaction regime, the infoton power spectrum is significantly affected by the gauge fields, as illustrated in this figure. Here in red, we give the infoton power spectrum at the end of the lattice simulations, and in dash blue, just for comparison, we give the standard scattering variant power spectrum corresponding to single field slow roll inflation. So as you can see, even in the weak back reaction regime, the infoton power spectrum can be significantly enhanced due to the interactions with the gauge fields. Um, our results for the enhancement are in good agreement with the analytic perturbative estimates. In this analytic expression, Xi is assumed to be a constant. And the shaded region in the figure is determined by the initial and final values of Xi. And you can see how the lattice power spectrum smoothly interpolates between the predictions for the initial Xi and the final Xi. Okay. And in the strong back reaction regime, as expected, uh, we observe an even greater enhancement due to the stronger interactions with the gauge roots. Okay. So, so far, so good. Nothing unexpected. What about the statistics of the infoton perturbations? Um, uh, as you can see, 
in this figure, the infoton, at least at the beginning of the simulations in the weak back reaction regime, is Gaussian, as depicted by the purple symmetric curve. And at the end of the simulation, the infoton is non Gaussian, as depicted by the red asymmetric curve. So, unsurprisingly, our lat simulations show that in the weak back reaction regime, the gauge with perturbations give rise to a non Gaussian curvature perturbation. However, in the strong back reaction regime, the curvature perturbations are Gaussian at the beginning and also at the end of the simulations. And they become non-Gaussian only temporarily at intermediate times. So surprisingly, our lot simulations show that strong couplings give rise to a Gaussian courage perturbation. Um, another way of probing the degree of Gaussianity of the courage perturbation is by considering the cumulants of its probability distribution. Um, for example, we can consider the um, skewness, the cortosis, as well as the hyperskewness of the courage of the probability distribution of the courage perturbation. And you can see that um, the three cumulants towards the end of the simulations tend to, at least in the weak back reaction regime, tend to non-vanishing constant values, uh, which again confirms that the Courage perturbation is non Gaussian in the weak back reaction regime. On the other hand, in the strong gauge weak back reaction regime, the courage perturbation is Gaussian towards the end of the simulations since the three cumulants attain vanishing values at late times. Um, we suspect that the um, emergence of Gaussianity at strong couplings could be a consequence of the central limit theorem. Um, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, the gauge fields induce infoton perturbations via the source term in the right-hand side of the equation of motion of the infoton field. The source term is um, quadratic in the gauge fields and it involves a momentum integral. The momentum range of excited uh, gauge field modes is determined uh, by the coupling strength. The stronger the coupling, the greater the number of statistically independent elements in the momentum sum. So at large, at large Xi, according to the central limit theorem, the source term should converge to a Gaussian probability distribution. And since I'm probably running out of time, I'll simply leave it there with my conclusions. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much, Kaloyan, for the nice talk. I see already a question by Andre, so please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. I, I have more like a conceptual question. So uh, when n is bigger than one in, in the infoton potential, you have a, a kind of natural moment of time at which you can stop your simulation, right? This is when w is sufficiently close to one third and you can say that, okay, we reached radiation domination and nothing interesting is going to happen next. So we can stop our simulation. However, when n equals one and you said that in the case when there is no interaction between the infoton field and other fields, we actually never reach radiation domination and W is always close to zero. Then I'm just wondering what is a, uh, how you decide physically when to stop the simulation. And, and this is also important because based on this, you decide that also ones are stable, for example. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, that, that's a very important question. Um, yeah, so uh, for the case when equal, equals one, uh, we have, essentially two scenarios. We either get oscillons or we don't. If we don't get any oscillons, then the situation is trivial. Whereas if we observe formation of oscillons, since the oscillons have a fixed physical size, their radius is fixed uh, and it doesn't expand with the universe. Whereas our lattice expands with the universe. We have a common lattice. Then we basically stop our lat simulations once we stop resolving the oscillons. Since as time goes by, fewer and fewer lattice points are within the oscillons. And obviously, once we have an order unity, you know, number of lattice points within the oscillons, then the situation becomes yeah. You know, well, well, yeah, that, that's why that's why I asked about the physical reason, right? Because that, then yeah. you could say that okay, let me just you know increase the number <laughs> of nodes and and go further in time. So that's that's why I asked this question actually. Right, yeah, so, uh, so uh, we basically have just a fixed number of lattice points. So there's no, if you like, adaptive mesh refinement or anything like this so that we can, you know, increase the resolution dynamically. 
So yeah, basically with our kind of rigid simulations, we just decide to stop our lattice simulations once we have 10 lattice points across uh, a single object, so to speak, yeah. Okay. And also it's quite easy to, you know, see from the evolution of the power spectra uh, when you start running out of this, uh, running out of uh, UV resolution and you start running into trouble, basically. So uh, here um, you can see that as long as the UV tail is uh, well resolved and we don't get any reflection from the UV cutoff, our simulations, we believe, are reliable. But yeah. once, you know, the Nyquist hits here, then we should stop. <laughs> All right, thanks. I think Mustafa Amin has another question. Kalun, uh, in the last part of the talk, when you discussed uh, non Gaussianity uh, from the from produced during inflation, uh, what is the expectation for what happens during the reheating phase to this non Gaussianity? Is this just on the super horizon scale? So you, you make the usual statements, but or is what is expected of non Gaussianity? how this evolves to the reheating phase. Yeah, um, so basically, uh, yeah, the expectations are not very optimistic in the sense that we are using parameters which are already kind of ruled out by the preheating dynamics, if we assume at least natural evolution. So if we don't add any extra ingredients to the model, we basically overproduce gravitational waves. And for example, we would violate uh, an effective bounce and whatnot. Uh, so basically this calculation was considered as a proof of principle that basically if we have, you know, strong interactions and nonlinear dynamics during inflation, a non-Gaussianity is not a universal consequence. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that's a fair point. And there is another question by Minsi Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I have a uh, maybe basic question. And when you show the power spectrum uh, generated by the parametric resonance, it seems that the small k part is enhanced. I mean, does it mean that this is affecting the, for example, super horizon mode or something? Um, yeah, that's a very important point. Um, the IR part of the spectrum is indeed enhanced. However, uh, once you start going to smaller and smaller K, once you start becoming more and more super horizon, the enhancement is reduced, it's atten attenuated. And you can kind of see this from the actual, uh, actual instability chart. You can see that as K approaches zero, you get a dark band here. And also here when we you know, start considering super horizon scales, we have to account for the metric perturbations as well. So all of these lattice sim simulations were sub horizon and we ignored metric perturbations. But if you start, you know, adding metric perturbations, the, the stability uh, chart changes for super horizon modes. So this can be trusted only on sub horizon scales, which are the relevant ones for the formation of infotonosteons. I see. So what, what kind of physics cause the, I mean, the suppression, suppression of the growth of the super horizon mode? Uh, well, I mean, the, the courage perturbation, at least according to Weinberg's adiabatic theorem, is, you know, ah. conserved on super horizon right. scales. All right. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. But of course, if you have multiple fields, the story can change and you can generate isocurrature on super horizon scales. But at least in single field mode, modes, the Weinberg adiabatic theorem saves you, at least in the linear regime. Once you become non-linear, it's a bit unclear and you have to run lot simulations which cover also super horizon scales. And this is quite costly at the moment. Just we cannot afford such dynamic range. Yeah. But, but in this case, the parameter resonance itself is uh, non-linear, non right? Yes, yes, yes. It's not okay. the linear parametric resonance which gives rise to this change of the super horizon modes. It's the non-linear, the, the mode-mode couplings, which gives rise to the change. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
So thank I don't you. see any other questions. So let me thank uh, Kaloyan again for the nice talk and pass back the word to the organizers. Thank you. The breakout rooms. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for the talks. Okay, so uh, do we want to, yeah, I will, anyway, I will create uh, three breakout rooms. So now people can join them, but uh, maybe uh, I know if we have something which we want to discuss all of us or some other questions uh, which we didn't have time to discuss. Well, if not, then, yeah, Andrei. Yeah, regarding the last talk, I have a very, very naive question to Kaloya and maybe to, to Mustafa. So is, is it possible that so you, the, the, the inflaton fragmentation, right, and you have some lumps, but somehow uh, fluctuations are so big that uh, they restart inflation again in, in, in certain certain points. Is that possible at all, or it's just? Well, Musafi, if you can take it. I mean, you've been for long enough to <laughs> around, you know, to know. No, uh, it's. I think it's. Uh, Kaloyan can answer this is equally well. I think it's difficult. You still, I mean, in general, generally speaking, the gravitational fluctuation. The gravitational potential associated with these oscillons is much smaller than unity. Um, it's not a relativistic object. By the same token, another way of saying this is that you won't get an order unity fluctuation on a large enough length scale to restart inflation. Right? There is a very large over density, but then the length scale is much smaller than the horizon. Okay. So, okay. So you yeah. either so oscillons are very over dense but they're not very large compared to the horizon scale, right? They're small compared to the horizon scale. So it's hard for oscillons to restart inflation in, in that way. So the probability of such fluctuation is suppressed by, you, you know, exponential to minus some ratio. Possible. I, I don't know scales. about actual suppression, but I think the general statement, I mean, you can make an energetic statement that if you want to restart inflation, you have to put most of the energy density of your field into one oscillon that's roughly comparable to the size of the uh -huh. size of the horizon, and that's hard to do uh, in my. But it's, chance fluctuations of many of them collecting together uh, in some rare region of space, right? That's then you're playing that game of tail of the distribution, uh, doing yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, but that yeah. I don't. I, I don't think, Colin, you can say we don't know enough about what to say about. Uh, okay. About, so so you, never saw, you never saw it numerically during, you know, no, years of simulation, never saw it, which means that it is suppressed, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely. And also, I think that if you uh, make energy clump so much and concentrate so much, it's more likely that you might form a black hole rather than, you know, start inflation within a patch. Yeah, well, that, that, that's another interesting yeah. point. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, we cannot see such... A phenomena with our large simulations because we well gravity is added to our simulations in the form of the frw equations <laughs> so there are no gradients in our you know uh you. yeah in, in the left hand side of the einstein equation <laughs> unfortunately i see i see yeah okay but so we should wait for like modern version new version of cosmologics right? yeah. or bigger computers yeah, <laughs> yeah. there were actually studies uh, with numerical relativity <clears throat> I remember Uri Clarich pointed out uh, people from Levandanov, uh, they did some study. I, I can try to look at it. So, so shall we join different rooms or uh, we can keep on this one? I don't know, it looks question. like these rooms are not very popular so far, there is no one. <laughs> no, because I'm he 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 hesitating maybe to, to say, okay, once the first speaker goes to the first room and so on. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can ask any a question uh, continuing from what I was asking. So I think you said so right now, if I understand correctly, in Cosmo Lattice, there's one nice selection of algorithms that works for um, gauged fields, Ga gauge U1 or SU2 uh, uh, and so on. And now if you do this, and I also with work with Kaloyan, we found that you know this phi FF dual has to be done differently. 
right? And you have done this as well. It has to be done differently. So is this, how are you structuring? Is this just going to be some separate part of your Cosmo Lattice? Yeah, it's modules. Oh. I, like the one advantage of Cosmo Lattice is that it, it separates every single ingredient you go adding, you know? So yeah. essentially uh, Cosmo Lattice has a structure that has like an engine with the equations of motion, another part where you define what are the elements of those equations of motion, like uh, potentials or first derivatives. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to define a new set of equations, like the ones for phi FF dual, uh, you have to define this module with these equations, you know, uh, but then you use the engine of uh, solving the equations with the algorithms that are already implemented, you know. Uh, I see, I see. It, do you think something like along with phi ff dual phi f squared would also be? I guess it's you're saying anything, all of those things. I'm, I'm not, maybe I should look into Cosmo Lattice better, but I'm trying to understand that you have to specify the algorithm to use amongst the choices that you have provided, or what? Yeah, how I mean, you, you, can al you can also implement your own algorithm if you want to right. put the algorithm, but what I'm but saying, I'm lazy. Is, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is we've already provided a plethora of algorithms for a scalar sector, for a billion sector, for a, a non abelian sectors, and also, uh, well, for the non minimal uh, coupling to gravity and for the chiral phi FF dual. Uh, the algorithms we are using are uh, Runge Kuta of order two or three. Uh, and those uh, are uh, non-symplectic algorithms. One of them even has uh, adaptive uh, uh, time measurement. Uh, and uh, those for those scenarios work beautifully because uh, I, I didn't show it, of course, because lack of enough time, but there are the Hubble constraint, the, the gauge constraint, no? uh, all of these constraints are beautifully preserved, you know, uh, all, all along the simulation. So, but, but, but at the end of the day, the message is that if you want to write a new set of equations representing a new problem, uh, you can maybe think of using some of the algorithms we have, or maybe you want to implement your own algorithm. You know, uh, The point is we have a language for the field variables and the operations over them, and all of it is connected, no? uh, and all the parallelization and everything, you don't have to do anything about this. You just have to worry about how you connect the different elements in your finite difference equation. You know? I see. It's a bit what you've done all your life. Uh, exactly, we try to make it uh, in a parametric way as general as possible, such that people can choose from a menu in case they don't want to uh, take the time you and I we've taken all our life to learn how to do this uh, inside, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the idea. That's I see. I see. And, and eventually, well, you know, uh, as I said, the non-minimal coupling to gravity is implemented and working. The axial coupling is implemented and working. The topological defects is implemented and working. Uh, gravitational waves uh, from a scalar sector is implemented and working. We just gonna wait uh, one year to do test, uh, uh, to get some papers out also, you know, but eventually we will release everything. Uh, yeah. Nice. And Danny, in terms of, you, you said that you were talking to Tom and others about uh, including gravity. So this is scalar potentials, linearized, being included. Uh, is that the... Is that no, the no. What I, what I had discussed with Tom last year, but then we didn't do anything, okay? It was about a full GR code, okay? Changing yes. completely the gears. So putting a module for full general relativistic equations. You know, uh, you know uh, Tom has his own code to do this. And he's actually demonstrated that for preheating scenarios, uh, the preheating stuff we do with the other type of codes we have is pretty much the same outcome with right. this, at right. this, uh, uncertainty. So, yeah, it would be interesting to have uh, a full general relativistic code because people ask about it. But I really am not sure about the, re the necessity in terms of applications. Right. Because if you think about gravitational potentials, scalars, and gravitational waves, I think linear perturbation theory is more than enough. Uh, right. You, even for gravitational waves, you can demonstrate that the energy source you can have in the early universe up to the maximum reheating temperature you can tolerate by B mode constraints, uh, so order gut scale, that's never going to produce gravitational waves beyond linear order, you know? Uh, so. Yeah, but it's, but I think, yeah, Danny, my, my, I think that as the interest is not so much about whether it changes the preheating dynamics. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you were able to, if the code 
eventually, if you have enough computational power, right, we want to also see clustering on long time scales. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's clustering. And that requires act, active gravity in the problem. That requires active gravity in the program, capturing those gradients, of course. Yeah. And, but as I said, if uh, as long as linear uh, gravity is fine, that's in the pipeline. Uh, okay. Going beyond that, so general radistic code would require to talk to Tom and see. Yeah, how I, I think I'm, yeah, I think the linear gravity is more because in many cases, uh, if you have long duration where you have clustering and stuff like that, people have already, of course, done lots yeah. of calculations of this. It's interesting, yes. and to to have something. Uh, yes. And even, there is, yeah. There is this code uh, by Easter. No, I don't remember if it does. The linear regime, or uh, or it does F GR. Uh, it doesn't do GR. Uh, I think it's GR. So it's a linear regime, and it still captures the clustering in the long term in m square phi square. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that yeah, but that I think what you're doing, which is also a good idea, right? And that's what I'll get some time to talk about today. Is you you can do the non relativist you can include non relativistic versions of the equations that allow you. It's much faster, right? Like you don't have to follow the oscillations of the field right. anymore. Because now you care about clustering, not about like mean field value approximation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. So I think that's what I was imagining that somehow if the code can be, I mean, the difficulty of this part is more, it seems, both sides of the code, I think, are in some ways understood. It's just making sure that there is appropriate things done for matching the relativistic evolution to the non relativistic version. Okay. Does it really matter in detail? Yeah, I don't yeah. know, but but I think we should just do it, right? Like it's, it's no, I want to do it also because there is the interest of uh, well, first of all, following the scalar fluctuations during phenomena after inflation, uh, even not in the long term, just locally, you know, uh, whether you can trigger possibility of producing a black hole uh, through a large energy density fluctuation. I think it's very hard, but uh, uh, yeah, th all of those things are interesting, of course. Uh, there was also the idea of uh, non-Gaussianity by Rajanti et al. that then was like corrected by the group in Canada, in Toronto, uh, a few years afterwards, where they were using the delta and formalism to follow the non-Gaussianity due to the inhomogeneities uh, in preheating, modulated by the initial uh, power spectrum of a spectator field uh, at super horizon uh, uh, fluctuations and that require a super precise code, for instance, uh, and to follow a scalar fluctuation. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, there are always applications. Yeah, I have it in my pipeline of uh, like to think uh, after we release Cosmolatis 2.0, which is going to deal, I think, with the most interesting particle physics interactions, axial coupling, non minimal kinetic uh, terms, uh, non minimal coupling to gravity, etc. Then, next step will be to think about gravity. How, how I can improve in that direction, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a question from Anya, I think, Anna. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask about uh, whether are the chances to implement the code uh, up to, for example, formation of black holes after inflation or some phenomena connected to clustering after inflation. Uh, and from my side, the motivation would be, for example, that if you have a long stage of uh, preheating, like it happens in Starobinsky inflation without uh, uh, large coupling to uh, from between Higgs and gravity. In this case, uh, you have a nonlinear structure formation out of uh, oscillating inflaton. And uh, it's, it would be even more general if you just have a scalar field, uh, which is not very strongly coupled to standard model, then you have very long term of long time of oscillations. Uh, they go into nonlinear stage and then uh, at some point you uh, get reheating. And uh, several years ago, there were some estimates of gravitational wave uh, signal coming from uh, uh, this uh, from the reheating process when all these uh, structures evaporate uh, and produce kind of quite strong signal depending on uh, the conditions, but the, the, these are only the estimates. Uh, I also participated in this work with Dima Globalov. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, in order to get some comparison with the, the recent uh, gravitational wave data, it would be nice at some point to have uh, more precise um, understanding what's going on there. But Anna, sorry, what? 
but what is exactly the question? Whether we can address that? Uh, yes, uh, whether uh, this code can be made uh, in a kind of... I, I mean, the code can be turned into solving almost any kind of equations, but I don't have experience uh, with this kind of clustering or the gravitational potential, but Mustafa does, so maybe he wants to answer you better what, what they have done. Uh, I mean, I can just say that in terms of gravitational clustering, um, it's just, as you, as you've said, right, it's just a matter dominated universe. So everything we know about what happens in a matter dominated universe today, take out the baryons because we're going to make life simpler and just have the inflict on uh, as stuck. It's just like dark matter, right? So all of the information can be taken over. So if I don't know whether it depends on what level of detail you want to know the answer. Uh, if you just want to know how much, so for example, what the nonlinear power spectrum would be of fluctuations, I think that you can take, some of it you can just take over from what we know of the late universe, but what that could happen. So it depends on the question you're asking. What, at what level of, do you want to know what the power spectrum, nonlinear power spectrum is, or do you, what is observable that you care about from this nonlinear clustering? And then I can say well, whether which one yeah, of, of course, uh, the main observable is gravitational wave signal, but this is kind of uh, an extra step. If you have some inhomogeneous clustering, and then at some point you have uh, all these uh, kind of inflaton made structures evaporating due to the heat in, into standard model radiation, then this should be the process which gives gravitational waves. I think so. Yeah, I, yeah. The so, question is uh, how to implement that and how to do it properly. Well, probably the greatest challenge to such uh, gravitational clustering simulations is just their length, their duration. Mm -hmm. I mean, gravity is really, really slow, at least in my experience. If you want to simulate, I don't know, relativistic fields like <laughs> like the Higgs field, whether it's not minimally not a couple to gravity and also at gravitational clustering, <laughs> then you have to simulate many, many uh, dynamical timescales of the relativistic field. And this makes the simulations quite quite challenging. So you have to wait for many infoton oscillations for gravity to kick in and make things cluster. And I'm not, I'm not sure if people are willing to spend, you know, millions of CPU hours or <laughs> I know how much it would take to, to capture everything, all the physics. That's why people kind of do this separation of scales, you know, studies where they either approximate the scalar field as just, you know, they, they use the, the time average of its amplitude and you, they use Schrodinger Poisson system, the Schrodinger Poisson system, or they just use relativistic, the relativistic approach and they forget about gravity altogether. So it's one or the other. But I think, yes. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm, I'm afraid I must uh, interrupt the discussion because it's already, 30 here and in principle the next session should st uh, start even though we didn't have a break so i wonder yeah. maybe we can have a uh, do we need a, a short break or we start right away i'm happy to start but, but this was a break right I'm yeah that was a break yes yeah. uh, so, uh, very <laughs> intense okay so then maybe uh are you here yeah i'm here so maybe we we have to start then Yes, sorry for interrupting the discussion. Uh, so let's continue then, no? So we continue with uh, Keith Olive. He's going to talk about gravitation portals and particle production, the inflationary heating. So I don't know if Keith is around. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, oh. But I'm disabled from sharing my screen. I think it's on the way. <laughs> uh, should, should be possible now. Ah, okay. Uh, zoom to share your screen. Okay. So I don't know if is it sharing now. No, not yet. No, but you you are a co-host as far as I can. Okay. See. 
Um, are you are you sharing from the same device? Um, yeah, I'm sharing from the same device. Let's try this way. Okay. Zoom would like to, okay. Um, so See, Zoom would like to record on. the on the computer screen. Would like to record this computer screen. Yes, I think you have to agree with everything. It may even want to restart, but maybe you can ignore that. Uh, screen recording. So it says okay. Um, we we see the screen. Oh, you see it now. Yeah. 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 Oh, so now we're okay. Yeah. yeah. You see the slide. Uh, can you you move see the first. The cursor. Uh, well, I, I don't see my cursor, but that's that's okay. Okay. Um, all right, but you see the title page. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be talking about uh, some recent work on gravitational portals, uh, and that's uh, using just gravity, a single graviton exchange to uh, for particle production uh, and uh, and also um, uh, production of the radiation bath in certain contexts. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use a background. Most of this, most of what I'm going to be talking about is model independent in the sense that it's just using minimal gravity uh, for the uh, for the processes, uh, but of course, in the back there still has to be some uh, inflationary model uh, to use as an example. And uh, for for the most part, I'll be concentrating on uh, Starobinsky models and really, actually, the T models that Andre talked about yesterday. Um, I'll make a point about distinguishing between instantaneous and non-instantaneous reheating. And you'll see what I mean by that. And then I'll move on to particle production and then production through the uh, portals. So uh, just again, to put it in context, most of what I'm going to be talking about is what happens after inflation. So the key steps, which I think most people are probably familiar with, is when you look at the equations of motion. And here I'm showing the example of the Starobinsky model. Um, and uh, this has... Uh, we start out at large field values. The, the field evolves according to its equation of motion. At some point, uh, the field gets to um, a value where the last 50 E-folds or so uh, begin. Uh, you, the field continues to evolve. Eventually, inflation ends. And by definition, that's meaning that uh, the, the, one of the slow roll parameters, epsilon, is approximately 1. That is when the acceleration <clears throat> um, uh, turns off. And then afterwards you have oscillations beginning and that's where all of the action in terms of particle production starts to, to happen. Uh, we define reheating as just the point at which the energy density in radiation now uh, becomes equal to that stored in the inflaton. And you can work out what the reheating temperature is in terms of some decay rate of the inflaton. So we're assuming that there's uh, uh, an inflaton decay. We parameterize it uh, as just a Yukawa-like decay. Uh, so there's an effect of coupling Y. Uh, M of phi might be phi dependent uh, and Y might be mass dependent, it might depend on the inflaton mass. So for example, if Y was proportional to M phi, you would have something more like a gravitational decay where it was, might be M phi cubed over M Planck squared or m phi to the fourth, over, m phi to the fifth over m Planck to the fourth. Doesn't matter, that's all thrown into y. And the reheating temperature then is just proportional to this, uh, to this coupling. And, but uh, before reheating occurs, you have the inflaton oscillations and that's where the particle production occurs. So let me just go back, uh, just say a word about the Starobinsky model, which uh, is, uh, can be very simply, uh, uh, described in terms of a modification to gravity uh, and just by uh, doing then a conformal transformation of the R plus R squared theory, uh, you end up with Einstein gravity plus the scalar field with a potential, which is that potential, um, uh, which is known then as the Starobinsky model for inflation. Uh, it, it's interesting to note and uh, that really this was one of the very first models of inflation, uh, even though it was designed not so much to explain all of the problems that we typically associate uh, inflation to solve, but rather to, to address the problems of initial singularity. 
nevertheless, uh, it really is dates back to one of the first written down models for inflation. And it amazingly has survived and still appears as one of the best models in terms of uh, 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 being consistent with uh, now uh, experimental data. So this is definitely a Planck friendly model of inflation. Uh, you can write the potential in different ways. You can easily compute the slow roll parameters, epsilon and eta, and uh, the overall coefficient, either m or mu, depending on how you write it, is set by the normalization of the quadrupole anisotropy. And that gives you something about 10 to the minus five in Planck units. And, uh, and it gives you very good values of ns and r. Uh, as I mentioned after Andre's talk, um, one of the reasons that we uh, sort of latched on to the Starobinsky model is because we found uh, that it's very easy to derive this kind of a model in the context of no scale su uh, supergravity. And uh, so starting with a Kähler potential of the form, in this case, T plus T star, so T is some, some volume modulus, for example, minus phi phi star, phi are just the rest of the matter fields, one of which is the, is the inflaton. Um, and uh, if you take a very simple super potential for, for the inflaton, is just essentially a Wesumino model of phi squared minus phi cubed, uh, then when you write down the effective potential, you see that uh, phi, the scalar, has a non-canonical kinetic term exactly of the type that Andre was talking about. So that's what I was saying. This comes absolutely naturally uh, out of this, this kind of a theory, as well as other examples that Andre talked about. Uh, the potential also takes a very simple form. V hat is essentially the, the, the potential like you would derive in global supersymmetry. So just the derivative of W uh, squared, and then you have the conformal factor uh, uh, on top of that. When you redefine the fields to canonical uh, 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 kinetic terms, <clears throat> then, and I'm sorry, I, I sort of mixed notation here. It's chi, sometimes it's phi prime. Um, that's a little bit my laziness. But uh, if, you, if the T field picks up an expectation value here, I'm just setting it equal to, um, uh, to one, and, and there's a relationship between the quadratic and cubic term, you get exactly the Starobinsky potential. And uh, that has to be somewhat tuned. Andre once called this accidental inflation. Uh, and uh, this is sort of an old picture for, the, uh, <clears throat> for the, uh, the microwave background constraints. I'll show newer ones uh, shortly. But this fits right in with what you expect or, or what you would like to have from the, uh, from, from the microwave background results. I should make a point that uh, no scale in, in context of no scale models, uh, reheating is not absolutely obvious. That is, unless, uh, unless you do something, uh, typically there is no decay rate for the inflaton. The inflaton would be stable. Um, and uh, there are relatively straightforward ways around this. One is to, uh, to include the inflaton in the gauge kinetic function in which case you can generate decays to gauge bosons or gauge genos in this case, and you can get reasonable reheating temperatures that way. Uh, it's also possible that uh, if you directly couple the inflaton, say to HL uh, in the standard model, in this case, uh, the inflaton can be associated with a heavy singlet neutrino, uh, then you again get direct decays and uh, if possible to get uh, uh, sizable reheating temperatures. So just bear that in mind. So just to, to repeat the, the inflationary context that I, that I have in the back of my mind is starting with no scale supergravity. Okay, so with a specific uh, form of the Kähler potential. Starobinsky model is derived with a very simple form for the, the super potential. There are others, by the way, there's a whole class of super potentials which all lead identically to the, uh, to the same potential. And that's because of the underlying SU2 comma one symmetry uh, in no scale supergravity. Uh, the T models that, that Andre talked about <clears throat> are going to be particularly useful for the type of uh, particle production that I'm going to be talking about because they offer uh, a sort of a wide variety of equations of state during the reheating process. 
These are all also easily derivable from no scale supergravity. So uh, the, um, the super potential now, uh, instead of phi squared minus phi cubed for the simplest case where K equals to two, the quadratic case, which I think was what Andre talked about. That's just phi squared minus phi to the fourth with some coefficients. And you can generalize that to have this uh, hyperbolic tangent to, to, uh, to any power. Uh, and similar to what Andre showed, the, these T models, uh, the potential looks like that. So it's half of Starobinsky and then it's, it's sort of a mirror image of Starobinsky um, on, on both sides. And uh, what's nice is that for small field values, uh, once inflation is over, the potential just looks like a polynomial of phi to the K. And uh, this is sort of our version of uh, what, what Andre talked about uh, yesterday in terms of the alpha attractors. So the alpha attractors are now defined, you see at, at the top, I wish, so my pointer doesn't work it seems, but okay. At the top, you see the minus three log goes to minus three alpha log. And that introduces the alpha that, uh, that Andre had both in the uh, Starobinsky models, which I think he called E models, and as well as the T models uh, that I'm talking about here. Um, and th this figure, for example, is only the, the K equals to two model. And the point that I was trying to make is that if you look at these lines that are coming down, so I have, you see there's lines coming down that are N equals 50 and 60. Those are the sort of the common ones and they look great. Uh, the only problem is N equals 60 uh, would require um, a reheating temperature, which would further imply a coupling in the way we've parameterized it, which is larger than unity. You see the, on the right, you see that the number of E-foldings is, uh, is linear, uh, well, linear in, in these units uh, with uh, either the coupling or the reheating temperature. And so uh, given a range of couplings, you get a, 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 a range of reheating temperatures, which is certainly, uh, sorry, range of um, E foldings, which is less than, than 60. And the lines that we have here, the, the shaded regions here, we're just saying that reheating temperature should probably be above the electroweak scale uh, for baryogenesis arguments. Uh, although if you really wanna stretch things and you show down to TBBN, uh, and then uh, the line that's labeled 100 GeV, that's not the reheating temperature, but that's the, that's the limit coming from having the maximum reheating temperature that if you have a Gravitino in mind that you don't overproduce uh, Gravitino. So you, we would prefer to be in this red range, uh, which is still great in, compared to the experiment. So the differences uh, are, are really sort of minor quantitative differences. Uh, and the alpha equal to one scenarios are, are, are just given by that line. Okay. So post-inflation, so inflation, uh, the evolution of the inflaton, everybody knows given by the uh, standard field equations, we have the energy density, the pressure, uh, and the equations of motion. Uh, if we allow for a decay, as I outlined, then you, uh, you have to modify these equations and then you have the opportunity for the production of radiation through this decay. Uh, and during the initial stages of this, we can approximate the Hubble parameters being dominated by the inflaton. And the equation of state uh, in terms of the parameter K that I mentioned earlier uh, is just K minus two over K plus two. So for K, again, for K equals to two is, which is the most common thing, you should just keep that in mind. Uh, in this case, W is zero, so it's like matter. And, and that's what we'll be seeing throughout. So the inflaton oscillations, uh, the inflaton, we can um, uh, separate this out by looking at the envelope function, phi zero of T, which obeys the, the, the classical equations of motion uh, times a periodicity function. So the, the, the field is oscillating uh, somewhat rapidly. Uh, the oscillation frequency here is given below, a little bit complicated function, but if you take K equals to two again, then omega is just equal to m phi. All that other stuff is just one. Um, and uh, so we have the periodicity uh, going on. And then in addition, phi zero is decreasing, it's just red shifting. Uh, and again, if you put uh, k equals to two, that goes as a to the minus three halves, uh, depending on uh, the lambda is lambda, it's, we're assuming it's lambda phi to the k now for, for small values of 
uh, of phi and rho end is the value of the energy density when uh, inflation ends. Okay. Uh, so again, for k equals to two, the energy density in the inflaton just behaves as matter. Uh, so it's just going as one over uh, a cubed. Uh, but for different values of k with different uh, equations of state, you see that that, that has uh, a different dependence on the scale factor. As I said, inflation ends, uh, which defines what rho end is when a double dot is equal to zero or when this epsilon h is equal to one. And that's also approximately the same for the more common uh, slow roll parameter in terms of the uh, scalar potential. So, you can solve this and you can do most of these solutions uh, analytically, which is, I think, part of the attraction to us is that uh, these equations of motion uh, actually have reason, are reasonably easily solved. Um, the, the expression for the energy density and radiation looks a little peculiar. This, this denominator here uh, looks a little complicated, but that's just because of the way we normalized it in terms of uh, the, uh, the value of the scale factor at reheating and the energy density at reheating. Um, and uh, on, on, on the figure here, I want you just to concentrate on um, the lower green dashed line, ignore the other one, and the blue. The blue is just the inflaton energy density coming down. It's scaling down as, uh, this is for k equals to two, so one over a cubed, uh, just like matter would do. And then you have the other one which builds up, so there's a maximum, the radiation density builds up to a maximum value here. So it's at about a little over 10 to the minus, 10 to the plus 45 in these units, and then starts to decrease. Now, it doesn't decrease as radiation. It doesn't go down as one over eight to the fourth because you're always pumping in more radiation. This is due to the decays. And I think I have the expression for it here. Yeah, so the radiation, uh, density is going down as a to the minus three halves. The temperature is going down as a to the minus three eighths. Uh, and as I say, that's because you're, you're, you're continuously pumping in um, uh, energy into that radiation bath. And eventually it becomes to dominate and that's what leads to the reheating in this case when, when the two cross. Uh, eventually you see now the, the blue curve starts to decrease very rapidly and that's because the decay now becomes to be dominant and the energy and the energy density the inflaton will start to exponentially decrease. And as I said, the, um, uh, the reheating temperature is just proportional to this decay uh, coupling. And there's a maximum temperature which is easily determined in terms of the value of the scale factor uh, when inflation ends uh, and is just determined by K. So it's just a fixed, fixed value for A max over A end. Uh, you don't have to just consider um, decays to fermions, which is the example that I'll, I've been looking at and the example that I'll continue to look at, but you can also do uh, decays into bosons or, or even scatterings, phi phi to BB, uh, and uh, for the different values of K. I, I just note that for K equals to two, phi phi to BB will not reheat uh, because the energy density falls off too fast and you never become dominated by uh, by the by, the radiation in that case, but you can work out all of these examples, and again, uh, you can do these all analytically. So, particle production uh, during the reheating process is sometimes referred to as freezing, uh, is what the case when you have a, a cross section for the production of particles, but that cross section is small enough that the that the rate for this particle production never comes into equilibrium. Uh, but so now you can. You can write down the Boltzmann equation for uh, for this particle. Chi now is some other particle, could be dark matter candidate if you want, or any other particle that might be produced out of equilibrium during the reheating process. We parameterize it uh, as just some t to the n as is going as some uh, energy to the nth power and with some scale lambda. And we can uh, look at the uh, production rate, which is, which is that cross-section times n squared. So this is now we're thinking coming from the radiation bath, which is being produced by the inflaton decays. So that's going as t to the n plus six. And you can rewrite the, uh, the Boltzmann equation uh, very simply, which again leads to uh, relatively simple analytical solutions. Uh, it turns out that, uh, there's a critical value for n where um, 
and for k equals two, that's that's n equals to six, where the final abundance, so at reheating, say, of whatever it is that you're producing, uh, depends either only on the reheating temperature, say for uh, n less than six, or actually depends on the maximum temperature that you uh, that you produce. For n equals to six, it's actually just logarithmic, but for n greater than six, you're more sensitive to the temperature at the maximum than you are at reheating. And so this could lead to very large changes into what you assume for particle production. And so for some specific examples here uh, for the particle production, again, I'm gonna concentrate on k equals to two, even though the figure has uh, k equals four, k equals three, you should probably ignore because it's got an unstable potential. But for k equals to two, an example might be uh, if you have a reading temperature of 10 to the 10, your maximum is 10 to the 12. Um, an example of this is just gravitino production. So same as what you know people have looked at for the last, uh, I guess now almost 40 years. Um, and so that would correspond to n equals to zero. Um, lambda would just be M Planck for gravitino production. And, and in this case, you see that for k equals to two, uh, if you take the scale to be a, sort of the Planck scale, you, you saturate when the gravitino mass is 100 GeV. So you get the classical result uh, that we've known about for, for uh, essentially forever. Um, if you're thinking about uh, uh, production through a, some mediator, then in this case, N is equal to two, you get some different uh, behavior for the production. You can, you can have smaller scales at smaller scales and you can then move to higher masses. Uh, the case that, another case that's interesting is this case for n equals to six. This would correspond to a case for production of gravitinos in say high scale supersymmetry. Uh, the difference here is that here we're assuming that all the superpartners are heavier than the inflaton. So in the classic case for gravitino production, you're singly producing gravi gravitinos. So you're, you're having the thermal bath producing say gravitino and a gluino. And that's what leads to n equals to zero. Uh, in this case, you can't do that. You're assuming the only particle lighter than the inflaton, only super partner lighter than the inflaton is the gravitino. You can only pair produce gravitinos and that leads to more powers of M Planck. Uh, the scale lambda uh, now is, uh, is, is, the, is the geometric mean between the gravitino mass and M Planck. And you get the re relic density in that case for a gravitino, which is about an EEV, which leads to all sorts of other interesting uh, effects. So let me come now to uh, gravitational portals. Um, and so, as I said, this is the idea here is that you're just looking at interactions mediated by single graviton exchange. And so you can write down what the uh, effect of Lagrangian is, the kinetic term uh, just coming from R, and then the coupling of the graviton or the fluctuation uh, to the energy momentum tensor, either of the standard model, of the inflaton, or some other particles, doesn't matter. And just using the, the uh, energy momentum tensor, depending on whether or not the particle you're looking at is scalar, fermion, vector. Uh, and so that leads to a number of different processes. And the three that I'll uh, look at are either the gravitational production of dark matter from the thermal bath. So here you have you're starting to produce the thermal bath from decays that the scatterings of that thermal bath through gravitons will produce say, say the dark matter. Uh, you can also directly produce the dark matter from inflaton scattering. That, that actually turns out to be far more dominant than the production from the thermal bath. And you can even go so far as to think about producing the thermal bath from inflaton scattering, again, only through gravity. So these processes are model independent. And in some, and again, they're there. Whether you like it or not, they're there. Anything else you do might add on top of these, but these processes are minimal in the sense that they're always present. So the production of dark matter or any particle from the thermal bath, you can again compute the rate. That rate uh, is going as uh, t to the eighth, so that would be n equals to two in the in the previous notation, uh, and you can then again everything is computable analytically. Uh, almost everything is computed analytically. The uh, number density of these particles, you can again compute uh, and eventually you can compute the uh, contribution to uh, the, uh, the relic density to omega, the closure density. And uh, 
so I'm not going to give a specific result for this, but you can sort of see it depending on your choice of the reheating temperature. If the reheating temperature is not really high, you need a pretty high uh, 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 mass for the dark matter particle in order to get the right relic density. And that's not a surprise because there's a gravitational process in order for, in order for this interaction to be strong enough, you need large masses. Um, but as I said, the process which far dominates that one is inflaton scattering. And so this is now directly coming from uh, these oscillations. And that's why the periodicity function starts to enter into all of these rates. At the bottom, you see the comparison between the production through scattering rather than through thermal uh, production. And you see the, the piece that really makes, every, makes this dominant is that it depends on the energy density uh, at the end of inflation relative to the energy density at, at, at reheating. And that's a very, very big number. If you notice that the, the scale factor at reheating is about, uh, could be as, as much as 10 to the 10 times the scale factor at, at the end of inflation. So uh, th this is typically a very large uh, value. And to get the right uh, relic density, so again, for K equals to two, you have this red line. Uh, uh, depending on the reheating temperature, you need masses which are maybe as large as 10 to the 10 GeV, uh, or could be as small as about 10 to the, uh, uh, as small as about 100 GeV if the reheating temperature is sufficiently high. For K equals four, it actually doesn't depend on the reheating temperature. And you get uh, just, uh, you, you, this is for scalar dark matter, I should, should, should mention. Uh, you actually get a single value for the, for the uh, scalar mass to get the right relic density. That's about 100 GeV, which is interesting. And that also is an upper limit uh, to that scalar mass. Uh, anything larger than that would produce a, a relic density, which is uh, in excess of what, uh, what we expect from Planck. Uh, and for K equals to six, it moves off uh, to the right. Um, so again, this is minimal. This you can't avoid. So you can have other processes producing dark matter, but this is, this is going to be there whether you like it or not. And so as again, for K equals to four, so um, for that particular example, and these are all the T models we're talking about again. Uh, make sure that that's clear. For fermionic dark matter, uh, you're, you're again pushed up to higher mass scales uh, because you need a spin flip. And so there's a suppression factor you see in the rate, which is m squared, mx squared over m phi squared. Okay. But otherwise, everything is more or less the same up to, up to some, some details. As a consequence, side consequence of this is that uh, instead of thinking about producing dark matter, you can produce right-handed neutrinos. You'll produce any particle in the standard model. You, again, you don't have a choice uh, because everything is going to be coupling to gravity. Uh, the figure is a little bit complicated. Uh, it's just a lot of information. For now, just concentrate on the, on the lower figures, the ones with dots on them, which correspond to uh, fixed values of the right-handed neutrino mass. And these curves correspond to the values of K and the reheating temperature you would need to get the, the complete baryon asymmetry from just the gravitational production of these right-handed neutrinos. So you don't need anything else. You don't have to worry about thermal production. You don't have to worry about any other production mechanism for right-handed neutrinos. This is just coming from gravity. Anything else is on top of this. And so you see, you do need to have K at least equaling to six for this to happen. K equals to four, the, uh, the value of the right-handed neutrino mass would be necessarily in excess of the inflaton mass, and then it would be kinematically suppressed in this case. Uh, I'll come back to the other curves uh, shortly. Uh, and then finally, the final case is uh, this production of the standard model particles. And so the example we look at is phi phi through graviton scattering to produce, say, Higgs bosons. Um, this effectively is a quartic uh, coupling phi phi HH. It's relatively small coupling on the order of 10 to the minus 11. Uh, and that's what leads to this uh, upper curve in the figure that I showed earlier. So again, you can compute everything analytically. And what you see here is that even though it doesn't dominate, this does not lead to reheating because most of this radiation is produced very early on when the energy density of the inflaton is near its maximum. And then it just falls off as one over A to the fourth. So it doesn't lead to reheating. But what it can do is change the maximum temperature, temperature and leads to an absolute lower bound on the maximum temperature. And if 
that if the coupling, I think it's on the next slide, yeah, if the coupling is less than about 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six, or the reheating temperature is less than about 10 to the minus nine, the maximum temperature is actually determined by gravity. And now if you have any processes which are sensitive to the maximum temperature, then it, those will actually be determined by this gravitational uh, production of radiation. Okay. So in the last minute or two, I wanna come to some uh, more recent work uh, with Andre uh, who's here. Uh, and that's, we suppose that there are some non-minimal couplings to curvature. Uh, and I would treat all the scalars in the theory more or less equally that they all will cou couple. So whether it's the inflaton, the Higgs, or some other scalar dark matter candidate that we might have in mind, we can rewrite this in the Einstein frame. We get some uh, non-minimal uh, uh, kinetic terms and we get again, a conformal factor on the uh, potential. Uh, for relatively small values of these couplings, uh, then we can expand this and again, get generate quartic couplings and they will lead to the same kind of interactions that we talked about for the single graviton exchange. And an example of one of these quartic couplings uh, I show here. Um, and where S and T are the normal Mandelstam variables, and this in terms of Xi H and Xi X. Um, once these Xi's are, are, are order one or larger, then this coupling actually starts to dominate over a single graviton exchange. And that's what's shown here. Uh, this is showing the ratio of just the thermal production uh, when Xi is non-zero relative to the thermal production when Xi equals to zero. Uh, and again, you can compute all of these rates um, uh, analytically. And here what you see is the effect on the production of dark matter. The line at the upper right, that's psi equals to zero. So that's the case where you needed the very large scalar masses depending on the reading temperature. But you see now when you turn these psi's on, and here we're just assuming the psi's are equal, you get for the same reheating temperature, you can get the right dark matter density for far lower uh, uh, dark matter masses. Uh, similarly, production from, uh, from inflaton scattering through, during the oscillations, same thing, as soon as these Xi's are turned on, uh, now looking at Xi phi and Xi uh, x, then uh, these okay. dominate uh, by, a, by a long shot uh, the, uh, when the, for the single graviton exchange. And, oops, there we go. And the same thing happens that the uh, that for a given reheating temperature, when uh, when these things are turned on, you can get the right relic density for far lower values of the uh, uh, dark matter mass. And here again, we're only considering scalar dark matter. And then the final case is when uh, you're tr trying to produce the standard model particles through through uh, uh, through the uh, through the scattering. And again, when you turn on the values of Xi, uh, these start to dominate uh, very quickly. And that, that has an effect on the maximum temperature. The maximum temperature now starts to increase that dashed horizontal line is the maximum temperature for single graviton exchange. When you turn these on, uh, they begin to dominate. Okay. And that leads, it's a little bit hard to see. I think there's the lower line the dashed line when Xi equals to zero. And then the, the one that you're seeing now, which goes up to much higher maximum temperature when you turn on uh, these non-minimal couplings. Uh, an inter again, an interesting side note, again, coming back to this figure, now the, the lines with the triangles, uh, this is now producing the, the radiation uh, directly from these non-minimal couplings. So when Xi equals to zero, it's very hard. Uh, you have to go to large values of K and even then you can barely get a reheating temperature above 100 GeV or so. But when these Xi's are non-zero, you see, uh, for example, when Xi is 100, you can get pretty large reheating temperatures even for values of K of, of, of say of order eight. So in this case, you're, you're producing the entire radiation bath directly from gravity. Anything else you have is on top of this. So I'm a little bit over, I'm sorry, but uh, when I come to the summary, um, it's obvious that reheating is an essential component for all uh, inflation models. In fact, I mean, this is what effectively killed Guth's initial, initial model of uh, old inflation because reheating just didn't occur. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious from what I've been talking about that 
instantaneous reheating approximation is, is way too crude. Uh, I didn't say it, but um, one thing I have been assuming, however, is instantaneous thermalization. In some cases, that's also too crude. And there was some very interesting work by Mustafa uh, and uh, Marcos Garcia looking precisely at that question about, uh, about the thermalization process. Here, I've only been talking about the reheating process. Um, particle production, as I said, is, can be enhanced depending on what these uh, uh, production rates are, how they depend on temperature. And uh, you can get uh, uh, production rates which are actually more sensitive to the maximum temperature rather than the reheating temperature. And these gravitational portals, uh, the way we view them are, well, these are there whether, whether independent of anything else that you're putting in. We've looked at them in the context of these T models because they're, they're very convenient in terms of calculation, uh, but you can do the same for any, any particular model of inflation that you have in mind. And, um, and they might be an important component for leptogenesis. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much Chris, for my talk. I see three questions just in the order I see here. So Laura Laconi, you want to go? Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was super interesting. I have a couple yeah. of questions uh, about, let's say, the first half of, uh, of the talk. So, um, uh, no scales, no scale, these no scale supergravity models, uh, why they're called no scale? And uh, I understand that uh, uh, for alpha tractors, you just have this alpha in front of the log. So, just have this. Uh, other parameter there, but alpha and alpha tractors are interpreted like is, it can be interpreted in a, in a geometrical sense. So I was wondering whether you can say a bit more about what it means just putting an alpha there, and if uh, these no scale models have a geometrical interpretation. So in order maybe to understand better what is the relationship with the alpha tractors. Okay, so there's a lot of questions. I hopefully I'll. Yes, sorry. Wall. But, but okay, the, the first one which stuck in my mind, why no scale? So the very first papers, and that's the Kremer, Ferrara, Kunas, Nanopoulos paper, uh, it was based on an SU1 comma one symmetry. Uh, and uh, in that case, they had no matter field. So the, the Kähler potential was just minus three log T plus T star. That's it. Um, and the scalar potential was zero. It was just zero. There was, you had, uh, so no cosmological constant, no, uh, nothing. And so that's where I think the name no scale came from because there was no scale picked out, no VEV for this T plus T star. Um, they, and this was back in 1983, 1984. Um, they then generalized the underlying symmetry. So from SU one comma one to SU N comma one, where n is the number of these matter fields, these phi i. So th that's, the, if you want to try and trace it to some geometrical, uh, it, it's the, the underlying symmetry here is based on this SU n comma one symmetry. Um, and this effectively leads to something, it, it leaves you with a potential now that is looking like global supersymmetry. So there again, still is no preferred value for the gravitino mass, unless you're doing again, something else to, to, to break supersymmetry. Um, the alpha there, uh, again, I think that was introduced also back in 1983. Uh, that has to do with the, uh, the Kähler curvature. So you can, com you can uh, this, the Kähler potential you can view is in terms of a Kähler metric in, on field space. You can compute the Kähler curvature um, and uh, the putting a, the value of alpha will change the value of that curvature. Um, I don't have all the expressions here that would, uh, there is a very nice talk uh, that, I, that, that you can use to relate um, the no scale theories actually with either R plus R squared or even R squared theories, uh, just plain R squared. The way, uh, and if you're interested, you should go back and look at some of the, the, the very early, just not even no scale supergravity papers, just the original uh, n equals one supergravity papers, which are all actually formulated in um, 
not in the Einstein frame, but in the uh, in, 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 in a Jordan like frame. And and when you go to the Einstein frame, that's where you you have the introduction of the Kähler potential and, and the super potential. And there's a very, very nice relation between how you go from that original supergravity frame to the Einstein frame, as you do with either the Starobinsky or just pure R squared. And by the way, R squared is just the sitter. So if you just start with R squared gravity, you, you just that's just a desitter model. There's no scale associated with that um, either. Um, so the alpha there uh, that could be uh, is part of a deficit in terms of uh, having more moduli. So sometimes uh, if alpha is taken to be less than one, you might expect other logarithmic terms appearing uh, as, uh, so this might be minus two log of T plus T star minus say log of uh, say S plus S star where S is maybe the dilaton. You have other types of moduli called U's. Um, this is actually something that Andre looked at as well uh, where you have these S, T and U fields and you have uh, you know, various uh, alpha I in front of uh, the logarithms in each of these fields. So uh, it's pretty rich. This is sort of the bare bones, simplest version uh, of the theory. I don't know if I got all your questions. Um, yes, yes. So, so can we say that um, these, the color um, geometry here is a specific curvature that is fixed? For the for the for the model that uh, is on the slide, yeah, I, I don't remember it. It's it's two thirds or, or, yeah, or something yeah. like that. It's, and, but it's and when you put an alpha, yeah. it's like two over three alpha or something. Yeah, like that. okay. So it, you kind of you just introduce a way of having a, a different curvature for the for the. That would space. be the geometric interpretation. And as I say, that was all done in eighty three uh, in the, in those early papers. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the review here that I list, the, the, there's a review by Lahanis and Nanopoulos, I think called The Road to No Scale. And I think almost all of that is, is, is in there. there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Sure. If there are no other questions, I have more questions, but uh, we we'll wait. A few questions. So let's take the opportunity to Mustafa. If you want to go, please be brief. So I can give also. Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's to my benefit to be brief here as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, Keith, thanks for the nice talk. I just, uh, I'm not sure if you were in the talk just before you by Kaloyan Ozanov. Uh, so one thing that I'm, I wanted to understand is, so you have this phi to the K models where the infinite potential at the bottom is some phi to the K. I think it's been shown that if K is bigger than two, then inevitably you can't, you will end up with an equation of state of one third, even without coupling to other fields just because the infoton oscillations are unstable. They fragment and give you a radiation dominated equation of state, um, even without coupling to anything else, right? So this, and because you are allowing for so many e-folds before you get to reheating, I think you might not have this k minus two over k plus two equation of state for k greater than two. Okay, for any, mm -hmm. and I'm saying even fractional powers, this seems to be true. And we've shown this with lattice simulations, I mean, uh, in detail. So I think it might be worth taking that into account because if you just assume it's homogeneous oscillations, I think you're losing out on that. Uh, you might be losing out on that part. Okay, I, we have not, uh, we have looked at the, some lattice simulations of these things and uh, in terms of uh, the effects on preheating, uh, but that particular effect, I don't know. Uh, maybe Marcos has looked at it. I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to talk to him about yeah, it. So this is, yeah, this is not, this preheating in the sense that it says into its own Infoton into its own quanta. It's not right. in this field. So right, that, right. You just inevitably get to, and Colin talked in detail about this, uh, you get to one third um, for any k greater than two. Uh, k equals two is special, of course, because it's m squared phi squared. Well, k equals to two would give you, uh, well, w, oh, uh, w, w zero. Uh, w okay. zero, k equals four would, would be k equals a third. Right, but I think I'm saying that it's not k equals four alone. It's any k greater than two. What this, this ends up being, it's not immediate. It's not that you get to radiation domination immediately when oscillations begin. But if you just wait enough amount of time, even without coupling to anything else, the field fragments and you get a radiation dominated equation of state. Meaning right, uh, okay. It quite, now the question would be how, um, how quickly that happens because right. if, uh, 
because most of the effects that I were talking about for large K actually happen immediately. Um, so you're not the anything that happens because of these oscillations later redshifts almost immediately. So I'm not sure that that would actually have an effect on the particle production, which is really all happening at row n. It's 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 happening right at at the start of these things. Maybe that maybe that I missed something because you're saying in some cases that things were happening at many many efolds after the end of inflation, right? So that's the reheating. The reheating is happening, but that's that's coming from the decay, not coming from these oscillations. But so, think, okay. so in in this picture, the the lower the, the curve that's lower on the left and 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 the one that intersects the blue curve here that's coming from a decay so that's just standard decay uh of the infliton right right um you're probably right that that does depend on on the value of k as well right. so that might be affected by what you're saying exactly uh, most of what i was trying to concentrate on on the portals is happening all at the very left so when a is very is relatively small um less than 10 or so um, uh, over a end. But it, it's a good point. I, I, it, it's definitely something to think about. Yeah, but I think Marcos is aware of this, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Because, uh, Marcos is certainly aware of these uh, papers, so he might, he might already have looked into it. So, oh, thanks. Yeah. Not too late, too late. We should continue. Thanks a lot, Keith, for the nice talk. And I, Mustafa, if you want to share your slides, so Mustafa, I will. Uh, yeah, I have to stop sharing those somehow. Stop share. Okay, there we go. Mustafa is going to talk about small scale structuring vector that matters. Sure, I will start. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we even see the yes. video. And uh, is something blocking? Like, is I'm going to try to see if I can. Oh, we see we see the whole screen, but you you, you know you can um, compress the zoom panel. Uh, if you click this three three dots, there is some option to compress this uh, zoom panel, I, which uh, which closes uh, for you the. Is this now gone? Uh, for for us, it was never there. Zoom does not show its okay. own interface. When it shows. Okay, okay, but now now you now you guys can just see the slide, right? Not the zoom panel. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Okay, great. All right, uh, thanks again uh, for the organizers. I think uh, already it's been fun. And uh, Dan, uh, unfortunately I didn't attack all the talks today, but I attended Danny, uh, Kaloyan and Keith's talk and it's definitely been great uh, uh, thinking about all the fun things happening in reheating. I, in this talk, um, will not, the organizers asked me to talk about uh, solitons, uh, and I will talk about solitons, but not necessarily in the context of reheating, uh, but I will mention how this can, I mean, it is relevant for that period as well, and I'll mention the connections as well. So the talk that I'm gonna give is about some small scale structure in vector dark matter. This is certainly related to nonlinear dynamics, the kind of things that can happen at the end of reheating, but I will be mostly talking in the context of dark matter and relating to this. Okay, uh, to start with, let me just say the, I will base this talk on three recent papers. Uh, Mudit Jain, who's a postdoc here and is on the call as well, he is in all three of them. Uh, Hongi Zhang, who is a graduate student here, is also on, is on one of them. And then Rohit Karur and Philip Marx are, are on one of them as well. Uh, now, and Rohit is an undergraduate. Okay, so let me, given that, you know, uh, this is towards the end of the day for most of you, uh, and it's probably been a long day. And so on Zoom, let me just point out the main message that I want you to take away from the talk. Uh, the main message that I want you to take away uh, is that when you think about dark matter made up of vector fields and light vector fields, then there is some distinct phenomenology that arises in these fields. One of this is that you get the formation and, or the existence at least, of these polarized, very long-lived field configuration solitons. And for me, the most exciting part about this is that they have macroscopic intrinsic spin, and which may be relevant on astrophysical scales. The second part I want you to take away 
is that if you are thinking particularly in the context of the late universe, then there are interference patterns in this field because there are wave dynamics, there are interference patterns, and shapes of halos that can be affected by the spin nature of this field. Given that this is a half an hour talk, I probably won't have too much time, but I want to also say that there's some nice recent work on production mechanisms uh, as well. This connects to the early universe. And if, uh, if time permits, I'll talk about it. Otherwise, you can ask me about this uh, in the uh, question answers later. OK. Again, let me just point out that uh, the phenomena that I'm discussing is nonlinear dynamical phenomena, but I'm going to be focusing on what is happening in the late universe. Similar things should be happening in a matter-dominated type of era in the early universe as well. But I'm not. I'm going to focus on scales that are in the late universe. Okay, uh, so let me just do a little bit of uh, song and dance about motivation and give you a brief introduction why we're thinking about this and so on. Okay, uh, well, I think everybody here. Almost everybody here probably agrees that dark matter exists. Uh, we don't know what its mass is. It can range, it has a very broad range. Something else we don't know about dark matter is what is its spin? Okay, we don't know what the spin of the underlying thing, the particles that make up the dark matter is. So I'm curious about answering the question whether we can explore the spin of dark matter from astrophysical or macroscopic observations in today's universe. With this in mind, uh, I want to focus on light dark matter, partly because light dark matter means I can do a, the occupation numbers will be very high, which means I can do a field here, field, classical field treatment. Secondly, also light fields, especially if they're ultralight, will give rise to astrophysical scales. The de Broglie scale will be astrophysical size, and for light cases, it, it will at least be macroscopic in size. Okay. So all of these things allow us to get to effects that can be on very large length scales. And that's what's interesting to me. Uh, and the nonlinear dynamics is also interesting to me. Okay, uh, so let's, let me just precisely define the model that I'm going to be considering first. So model I'm thinking about is just a massive vector field, okay, that will behave as dark matter, minimally coupled to gravity. That's all there is uh, in the problem uh, at the moment. I will add interactions later on in the talk. This is very similar to just an m squared phi squared field with gravity. And this field, whether it's m squared phi squared, whether it's a scalar field or a vector field, uh, can behave as well. So I'm, because I'm interested in sort of late universe physics, uh, this, by the way, even can be done in the early universe, but let me still focus on the late universe here. Because I'm interested in late universe physics, I'm interested in non-relativistic behavior of this field, which means I don't care about length and time scales comparable to the Compton scales. As a result of which you can integrate out these fast time scales and length scales in the problem and derive effective actions for the non-relativistic degree of freedom. To be precise, you take the vector field W and you split it into a slowly varying part psi, which is again, a, is a complex vector. W is a real value field and some fast time oscillation on the Compton scale. And then you integrate out the fast time scales to derive this effective action. Again, I recommend the work uh, by uh, Kalayan here uh, on doing this for vector fields as have already been done for scalar fields before. Then uh, Mudit, Jain and I, we generalize this also to arbitrary spin S bosonic fields where you can do the same. So what are the equations of motion for this non-relativistic part of the field? That looks like a combination of a Schrodinger equation along with the Poisson equation. And this is true for whether you are talking about a vector field, a scalar field, or a higher spin field, if it exists in nature, as long as it's massive and you can take a non-relativistic limit. So the key thing that's different from the scalar case is this psi is now a complex, in the vector case, it's a complex three-dimensional vector. That's what you have to keep that. Okay, so this, why do we want to do this? This makes simulations and everything a lot easier because you don't have to track things, uh, the fast time scales in the problem. So that's why it's very 
very good to do this uh, here. It also makes analyzing certain situations a lot simpler. And by the way, this is very general. Okay, this is, I don't think this is, uh, there's much we have assumed. As always, uh, should be aware of conserved quantities in the system. Uh, these include, because you're in the non-relativistic limit, even though you have a real valued field, you can define a conserved particle number. You can, there's always a conserved energy. Something that's going to be important as we, through the talk is that along with the total angular momentum of the field, the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum are conserved separately okay, in the non-relative signal. Uh, so, and this, the spin angular momentum usually is something, in fact, it's almost something that ne people never think about uh, in this context, have not thought about in this context, and it'll be important. Okay, so now let me tell you what the implications of this, if dark matter was a light vector field, massive vector field, what would that be? And to highlight the differences between them, I'm going to try to focus on two major effects. Highlight the differences with scalar case, I'm going to focus on two major effects, interference and, polari and these polarized solitons. The interference, and I'm going to structure it in such a way that first I'm going to give you the analytic intuition for it, and then I'm going to show the numerical simulations. So the interference effect that I'm going to talk about is embarrassingly simple. Let's take, suppose that dark matter is, a scale, is made up of a scalar field. Well, then if you superpose two scalar waves, they have to interfere with each other. There's nothing you can do. So the square of the sum is not the sum of the squares. Okay, this is what wave phenomena is all about. Okay. However, if you think about it being a vector field, then you could put and you are superposing two waves, you can put some of the wave in one component and another part of the wave in another component. And now if you superpose them, then you can have no interference because they're in orthogonal components. So this should hopefully give you intuition that interference effects in vector dark matter should be less than similar effects in scalar dark matter. At the bottom, I'm showing you the density resulting because of superposition of many waves. The orange is the vector case, the blue is a scalar case. And you can see that the peaks are higher and the valleys are lower in the scalar case compared to the vector case. This is just interference effect happening. You can do it a little bit more carefully uh, if you want. It's not that much more work. You can show, of course, that because the vector has three components, the interference effects appropriately defined are down by a square root of three compared to the scalar case. And you can generalize this to a spin S field where the interference effect will be down by a square root of two S plus one compared to the scalar case. This is just the fact that you have more components. Okay, so that's the intuition about interference effects. Let me now give you some, some statements about solitons here. Um, so solitons, in these in scalar fields have been known for a long time. If you take actually the not just a non relativistic part, but the full equation, you can show that there are coherent configurations of the field where the field just oscillates up and down for a long period of time, even if just there are gravitational interactions. Okay. Uh, you can write down these solutions uh, end up being parameterized by essentially two numbers. This is the mass of the boson the fundamental boson, and then something like, say, the binding energy per particle in the system. In the non-relativistic limit, you can write down the mass of such objects in terms of the Planck mass and the mass of the boson, as well as its binding energy. You should think of these solutions in a way as being parameterized by one parameter now, if you fix the mass of the boson uh, in, the, in the Lagrangian, and that is by the scale mu. Mu over m, is a measure of how non-relativistic the system is. So if mu over m, the binding energy is small compared to the rest mass, there's a very non-relativistic system, otherwise it's a relativistic system. And just by the fact that you have m Planck squared over m in, the, in front, you can tell that this is going to be a very massive, this can be a rather large, massive macroscopic object. Similarly, the radius of this, because it's m over mu, it's much larger than the Compton scale in the non-relativistic. Okay. So these, by the way, are, if you fix the total mass of the configuration, then these are the lowest energy solutions of the system. 
So what about the vector case? It turns out that if you have vector, this was for the scalar case, which have been known for a while. For the vector case, all you need to do is attach to the scalar, whatever you had done with the scalar, a polarization vector in front of it. So one example of this could be linearly polarized objects uh, like this, okay? Another, which uh, Kalerian and Peter have pointed out. Another example would be something which is circularly polarized. Okay? Uh, you can have two different types of polarizations uh, of the vector field. And these both turn out to have this, if you only have gravitational interactions in the non-relative sig limit, they, have to, they happen to have the same energy okay, for the fixed mass. And these are new, people hadn't uh, uh, done this uh, before. So this, and something we realize uh, is these configurations can now, because of the vector nature of the field, can have macroscopic spin, intrinsic spin. And in the case where you have circular polarization, the macroscopic spin of the configuration is just h bar find the number of particles, if you want to define it that way, in this object. So this is a huge macroscopic spin. This is not orbital angular momentum. This is spin angular momentum. You can also take linear, com because they have the same energy, you can take appropriately normalized linear combinations of this, and you would end up with fractionally polarized objects here. And these also can exist, okay? They have the same energy. So why had, this was all happened in the last year or year and a half or so, so why had these not been pointed out before? So one of the things people had done before uh, was to look at configurations in vector fields, especially in complex vector fields, called PROCA stars. And these configurations, perhaps it was related to the symmetry of the configuration. People had thought about things that uh, had vectors pointing radially outwards. But if vectors have to point radially outwards and they have to go to zero at the origin, which means there is a node in the profile and nodes cost energy. So those, those hedgehog profiles end up being higher energy than the configurations that I was discussing. Earlier. So the configuration I was discussing are more likely, they're energetically favorable than the hedgehog configuration. So that's why I think these new ones are more interesting in, our, in my view. Okay, so that's all I've been telling you about sort of uh, the analytic part, analytic understanding of these things. Let me just show you some simulations and observational implications. So here are, for pedagogical purposes, I'm going to continue doing a comparison with the scalar case um, so that you can see the differences between the two. On the vertical, on the horizontal axis is time. And the two panels, the top panel is vector dark matter, the bottom panel is scalar dark matter. The initial conditions are identical in both in terms of density. They're idealized halos starting with identical densities uh, in both cases. Uh, for the scalar case, of course, there is no vector configuration to choose from, or there's no spin to choose from. In the vector case, I have, in this simulation, we've randomly chosen the spin of each configuration there uh, for each configuration, but the density is the same for the scalars. And as you evolve them forward, I don't know if your screen allows you, but you can hopefully in the final panel, in the leftmost panels, or sorry, the rightmost panels, you can see the final state. In both cases, the final state is some central dense region surrounded by a halo. Um, and the halo is already, hopefully you can see it, there's a difference in the halo. There are interference patterns that are far more pronounced in the scalar case, which is at the bottom, than in the vector case. And this is reflective of what I was telling you earlier. You can't quite see it by eye, but also the solitons in the center are slightly different. And I'll talk about that uh, quantitatively next. By the way, these are some of the first simulations, I would say the, the R, in fact, the first simulations of nonlinear dynamics of vector dark matter. Um, so let me say something quantitatively now. So here I'm plotting the, on the vertical axis, the density of the final halo that is formed and the horizontal axis is a radius. Okay. Uh, the blue curve is a scalar case. The red curve is the vector case. The width is because we have run many, many simulations. And this is sort of the, the variation of the results in, from the simulation, from many different simulations. 
Hopefully you can see that for identical initial conditions, the, up, the core in the center is denser for scalars compared to vectors. Plus, you can hopefully also see that in the vector case, the transition, that is in the red case, the transition to the eventual tail at large distances is smoother than in the scalar case. So this is a, a quantitative difference that arises uh, between the two cases, when, even when you start with identical initial conditions. By the way, in the central case, the profiles in both the scalar and vector cases are of a soliton. In the outskirts, the tail is consistent with having something like an NFW tail. But you might argue uh, that this is all based on my knowledge that the initial conditions were identical. Um, what if I don't know the initial conditions? So here we are trying to do a comparison where we scale out the central density as well as uh, the char a, a characteristic scale corresponding to that. Uh, and then we are only focusing on the shape of the final halos. And again, you can see that there is a distinct difference in shape corresponding to the transition from the soliton profile the NFW profile between the vector and the scalar case. And this hopefully can be probed observation. Again, these scales that I guess in the previous, I put kiloparsecs and solar masses here. You can scale this because of the symmetries of the Schrodinger Poisson system. You can scale these things, even the scales that might be relevant in the early universe where it's microscopic scales if you wanted to do that. There's a symmetry in the problem that allows you to scale these results. Uh, again, a bit more quantitative uh, about interference patterns. So we take the box at the end of the simulation and plot the histogram of densities in the box. On the vertical axis, it's just the number of pixels with a certain density. On the horizontal axis is the density in the box uh, or the density, values of density, sorry, compared to the mean. And you can see that the vector case, which is this reddish thing, has very little power at extreme low densities in the box. This is because interference doesn't, there's not enough interference to allow you to get to zero densities very easily. Whereas a scalar case, because it has in significant interference, can get you all the way down to zero quite easily. That's on the left-hand panel that you can see. Similarly, at the very extreme high density regions, the scalars can have more extreme high density regions compared to the vectors. Again, this can be understood in terms of interference. Uh, maybe I'll skip this. This is about the two-point correlation function of density uh, of the field outside the central's core. This is important somewhat for observations in terms of the size of these interference granules that you're forming. And we confirm that in the out outskirts, interference granules are the same size in scalars and vectors, but the amplitude of fluctuations of the interference granules is higher in scalars compared to vectors. So this is something that can be, that can actually be used directly from can be measured, hopefully, from observations. How would you do this from observations? Uh, one example is to look at uh, the heating of stars. So these interference patterns give kicks to stars, which means they change. They can change their orbits, and they can. This is called dynamical heating of stars, and this has already been used in the scalar case to tightly constrain the mass of the boson that makes up the dark matter because it cross. It, it affects the scale of these patterns. And that can easily be used for now arbitrary spin fields given our results to also constrain that. And I can talk more about this if you're interested, but given the audience, I'll skip through this at the moment. There's a lot more that can be said about the map, about the relationship between the central core and the halo. But again, I'll skip these things in the interest of time uh, at the moment. I want to say a little bit about this intrinsic spin that I've been talking about um, in the system. We track this through the simulation. And here I'm showing you a plot of what the intrinsic spin density looks like in the core. As you can see from the simulation, the intrinsic spin density in the core seems to be all aligned. This is a strong indication in our view that, a sol that there exists a soliton in the middle. Remember, this is what I'm showing the arrows for here is not the vector field. This is showing the spin density. And the spin density would be non-zero even if you have a partially polarized object, meaning it has some components in the linear polarization and some components in the circular polarization. 
as long as it has some component circular polarization, you should have non-zero spin density. And, but the fact that it's all aligned is a strong indication that you form solid hot spin. And we've, this is a complicated process and much more needs to be understood here about what's going on. We did some statistics on this of how the initial spin in the total box correlates with the final spin in the core. Again, feel free to ask me about what's going on here uh, in detail if you're interested. Okay, so, so far I've talked all about only gravitational interactions and in the non-relativistic plant. What if you include attractive or repulsive interactions, uh, self-interactions in the vector fields? What happens then? In some recent work, we've also shown that these solitons still exist. Uh, this linearly polarized and circularly polarized solitons in the vector field still exist here. But now the degeneracy, the fact that they were equal energy is no longer true. And depending on the attractive or repulsive nature of the interaction, one of them is preferred over the other. Uh, so this is, I think, another here I'm giving. And you can effectively massage the Lagrangian to show that now there are spin-spin interactions in the system to, that breaks this degeneracy between the states. And this can again be true even when for example, this is, previously I was just talking about gravity. This is without gravity, with just self-interactions. Now I'm showing you some results from a case where both gravity and self-interactions are included. But we can, again, now, in the interest of time, I don't need to go through this. How much time do I have, Javier? Uh, five minutes now. Five minutes, excellent, okay. So in the last five minutes, uh, I do want to tell you a little bit about other, implications of this non-zero spin that I've been talking about, uh, of the objects or even in the field that, that exists. First, I could just, because Newtonian gravity is of course blind to spin off objects, uh, as long as the objects are far separated, it's not like it's blind. Uh, but GR is not. So if you calculate here is an example calculation of the post-Newtonian effects that could arise. Uh, these are small, but there's macroscopic spin here. So it's worth thinking about, as you say, the beginning first steps of how something like this would affect things. Uh, here is something more about uh, thinking in terms of full numerical GR. Again, the simulation is for scalar fields right now. Uh, I can, this is not for the full vector simulation, but we are trying to re replicate this with the full vector case, but we haven't. We haven't gotten there yet um, in this case. And trying to look at gravitational wave production from these things. Uh, what about non-gravitational interactions with standard model fields? For the scalar case, if it was an axion, a natural coupling would be phi FF2. And with these solitons, people, we have done it, and other people have done simulations of sort of what happens when solitons collide or they're put in external magnetic fields they end up being efficient radiators of electromagnetic radiation because of that. And this is something that you can look for in the sky. Uh, what we are trying to do now is thinking about generalizing this, including with these higher spin fields and trying to see what the, their effect would be on uh, radiation. But again, these are early days and a lot more thinking needs to go into thinking about this. This is more of invitation of what kind of things can be done than saying these have been done so far. Uh, I told you that I won't have much time for formation mechanisms, uh, and that seems to be true. So I'll just recommend that there was a recent paper by Gorgetto et al. about forming of these objects from just gravitational mechanisms in the uh, related to gravitational production of dark matter in the first place. Uh, and they've shown that these things can form rather naturally. Uh, there are other mechanisms that have not yet been investigated in detail that can also form these objects uh, that have been done for scalars, but it can be done for vectors as well. Uh, let me skip through the details of these things uh, at the moment. Sort of connects to some of the things Danny had been talking about as well, and Color and we're talking about, about tachyonic instabilities and so on, about how these can be produced, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that for later. Okay. Finally, just to end my talk, let me just say that you can generalize what I've said about vector cases I've alluded to this many times to arbitrary highest spin fields. Again, you have to worry about the self-consistency of the high energy limit of these series, but at least in the non-relativistic limit, 
nothing is preventing you from doing that. Uh, and you can write these Schrodinger Poisson like systems for higher spin fields. You can classify the types of solitons you can have in them uh, quite nicely. And they form into a nice family uh, of solitons that have been known before. Here's sort of a family picture just solitons, just with gravity, solitons, just with self interactions. Previously, they were just discussed for spin zero fields. Now we are saying that you can discuss this same kind of things for higher spin fields as well. Okay, to end my talk, uh, let me say that uh, this is a test, which maybe somebody will be able to answer somebody, is that I'm showing you, as I click here, and hopefully it runs, there are three simulations here. Okay. Um, one of them is for a scalar field, one of them is for a vector field, and one of them is for a tensor field, a spin two field, all of them massive. Hopefully if I've done my job, you should be able to tell which one is which uh, in here. So with that, uh, let me end my talk. Thanks. So thank you very much for the nice talk and for the final question. I don't know if someone wants to, to try. Questions? Okay, so I see Andre, you want to go first? Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. So the last picture is with scalars, right? Because there is a... Okay, uh, yeah, I have a... So, so how compact are this uh, vector solitons compared to scalar boson stars and compared to Broca stars? And how close can you get to, to compactness of the black hole? So for the, so let me say very, so, so far we have only done it for the non-relative, every, all this work for these polarized objects has been done in the non-relativistic limit. Okay, so I cannot make a concrete statement in the relativistic limit where the compactness becomes comparable to black holes. So I cannot, I cannot give you a quantitative state answer yet um, about whether how stable they are, how long lived they are at, all, uh, at the moment. Uh, we are looking into this, Kalyan is looking into this for individual objects. As I said, we are looking into this for collisions as well, but I don't have an answer for you in that context yet. Uh, so you should definitely wait for that, that whether they can get com as compact as uh, as our compactness comparable to neutron stars, whether you can get there or not in this case. We yeah. don't know. Uh, but that, sh that doesn't affect many of their implications. You don't have to be, the, gravi the individual gravitational wave signal, of course, gets affected by that, right? Because otherwise the signal would be too, too small. But otherwise it's not so, it's okay. Uh, all the other things will still go through in the non-relative signal. Does that answer your question? So I think my basic answer is in the relativistic, in the GR limit, we don't know the answer yet. Is is a clean answer. Yeah. But when you compare in the non-relativistic limit, when you compare scalar configurations and vector configurations, what do you see? So they're they're the same. In the non-relativistic limit, they are you will see no difference in the if you're just looking at the energy density profile or the mass density profile, identical. Yeah. Okay. It's identical. Okay. It's identical. Of course, when you introduce interactions, though. You have to be a little bit careful. Okay. Yeah. You have to be careful what is going on. So the profile will be, you can map it onto a scalar case with interact with self-interactions, but you have to be a little bit careful because the structure of the equations is slightly different. Yes, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um Danny, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa, for the nice and clear talk as usual. Uh, I may have asked you this in the past. But sincerely, I don't remember not only your answer, I'm not even sure if I really ask you this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somehow it has to do with the Lagrangian you are using to bring up these uh, vector fields. It gives me the impression you are abandoning gauge invariance. Uh, maybe you tell me no, and then the question doesn't make sense. But if you tell me yes, then I still have a question which is if you are really abandoning gauge invariance because you are giving these mass terms or even higher powers of these bilinears of gauge fields, why do you keep the kinetic term still with the F mu nu, F mu nu structure? 
which in my mind it's only due to gauge invariance, you know. Uh, otherwise, couldn't you just put time derivatives of uh, to make an ordinary kinetic term as you do for scalars, but for each component of the of the vector? And would there be a difference, you know, in the dynamics that you get? Uh... I think so, Daniel. It's a it's a great question, right? So certainly at the at the action that I showed you that I started with gauge invariance is lost, but you could imagine this coming from a Higgs field, you can imagine that I've integrated out the Higgs. So there is gauge invariance in the system for the whole full system. I've just integrated out the Higgs. Okay. So if I integrate out the Higgs and I'm in the broken phase, I will still have a mass for the field. I will introduce interactions in the field as in the field as well, but I've just integrated out the Higgs. Okay, so you are assuming uh, that you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking of some sector that you don't specify which provides the mass to your guys. Uh, For example, there are other ways of doing the Schuckelberg way of doing this. There's a Higgs way of doing this. There are different ways in which I can get here, right? Mm -hmm. So you could, you, and the, in, given that sort of motivation, I think it's natural, the type of uh, action that I begin with. But I'm beginning with a low energy effective action, which I make even low energy by okay. going to the non-relativistic limit. Of okay. this. Very good, very good. And then, Last, a very small comment. Uh, in your blackboard at the back of you, you have a wrong sign. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which one? Which one was it? Can you look? <laughs> I, I, I let you choose. Sorry. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the next question. Sorry. Misa, <laughs> uh, you want to ask? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I wonder. Uh, I have an impression that uh, say your model in which you consider a vector field is completely equivalent to the scalar field theory with three components. You are, Misha, you are absolutely right in the sense okay. that in the non-relativistic limit. Yeah, in non-relativistic limit. Non so from this point, yeah, okay. So you could, you could, everything I have said, as long as you make the three scalar fields have exactly the same mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can think Isos about kind of isospin or whatever exactly. and uh, yeah. re representation of some group or Absolutely. something like that. Absolutely. Uh -huh. So I think you uh -huh. could think of this as isospin in mm -hmm. that case. And all the things I've said, you can talk about this as isospin uh, in this context. So I think the dynamics doesn't change in the non relativistic limit. The dynamics of the field doesn't change if I think of them as three identical mass scalar fields versus three tuple coming from a vector field. So you're absolutely yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, and another very short question. Uh, you said uh, this is very light field. You never told us what the mass is. So I assume it's kind of fuzzy duck matter uh, where the mass is very, very small of the order of, uh, okay, dwarf galaxy or something like that. Uh, I didn't quite, no. you know, that's not what I, uh, I so it depends on the applications. If I'm, if I, when I was showing you things for halos, where I'm going to see this in the sky. There, I'm assuming this to be very light mass. I'm assuming these, you know, uh, those that I did assume to be fuzzy kind of scales, but although it was not the by 10 to the minus 22, it was heavier than that. But I can tell you that even if I assume it to be a axion mass, I mean, axion mean QCD axion mass scales, yeah. I can still form very macroscopically large objects, even astrophysically large. Why? Because I have another scale, which is a binding energy per particle. Okay, so even if the mass scale, the boson mass scale is QCD, mm -hmm. uh, I can still make these objects astrophysical in size by saying that these are very fluffy, they have low binding energy. So I can still get to astrophysical scales based on. So it depends on, you know, what your theory mm -hmm. is, but I think it's a very, the statement, all I want to say is that the mass is low enough so I can cross classical field theory. Mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my only concern. So all the dynamics I said goes, goes through for all of these cases, depending on the application that you're interested in and what your theory, underlying theory was, you choose the mass of the boson and the, tip, and the formation mechanism will typically choose, choose the binding energy per particle. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Kaloya, uh, Thanks, Mustafa, for the great talk. Um, just a minor question about one of the slides towards the end, uh, which you just flushed. Uh, about the production mechanism of uh, massive vector fields. Yeah, you mentioned that you're thinking about basically a Proca theory uh, with uh, self-interacting massive vector field. So uh, what is your opinion about uh, uh, the intrinsic instabilities in the in self-interacting Proca fields? Are they like completely uncurable or could they be, you know, saved by, you know, uh, playing some tricks and 
trying to cook up a clever model? I see. That's a, that's a nice question, Carlo. And so there were recent papers for some of you who might already know this uh, by a group at uh, Rice, as well as there was a group at, uh, at Johns Hopkins, both of them have the paper where they argue that when you introduce at least thinking of the full theory as just being a massive vector field with attractive or repulsive self interactions, okay, not, not completing the theory with Higgs or something like that. If you just take that theory, you will find that the constraint, different ways of thinking about it, but you will find that you can enter into a regime where the theory becomes ill-defined, which means that you lose predictability because the constraint equations have roots that you have to end up having to choose. And inevitably you are driven into a, you are driven into a choice that you cannot make where the evolution the evolution either has to be discontinuous or you can't figure out which route to go on. Okay, so it, it becomes very tricky. Now, my statement about this is that I think, yes, this ex I, I think I haven't looked into complete detail, but I think it exists that there is this region. This is just in a classical theory, this exists. But I think there is no care, there's no reason for why you could not have evolution of these fields where you don't reach this boundary. This boundary is reached when you're already sort of, the validity of effective field theory is getting into question. The amplitudes are quite large. You're, you, you have to start worrying about whether you really trust your theory in the first place. So as far as lattice simulations and things like this are concerned, I think it's still worth doing, but keeping in mind that you can't make the field amplitudes go into a regime where these problems in the theory exist that have now been documented. So I don't think there's any problem with Studying it just apart from saying that we should be aware. For okay. things like super radiance, this becomes critical because there's an exponential instability that you keep on, you, want, you keep on populating and there you, it seems that you inevitably hit this bad region. So there it's a problem. But here, if you have back reaction and things like that, where something doesn't allow you to get in that region, then you're perfectly fine dealing with this. Okay, so yeah, as long as you don't go comp like really extremely nonlinear, if you're just, I don't know, mildly nonlinear, you might be still kind of... You might be okay. I think you just, there, I mean, these papers have defined the boundary, right? So you just have to make sure you don't, you don't. Your initial, they have, people haven't figured out what the basing of attraction for that boundary is, right? Mm -hmm. and if somebody figures that out, then they will know not to stop there. And then everything would be okay. It's that region that's bad. But I don't know if this is what that basin is. We don't know any, we don't know it. But it's a nice, those papers are nice and it's worth looking into. Thanks questions and literally one minute and a half. So I will ask everyone to remove the to be in Libri. Um, Itamar, maybe you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, Mustafa, nice to see you. Um, it's a really quick question, but um, about the interference phenomena. So I, I guess the kind of interference you're thinking about is like a superposition of wave amplitudes or something like this. Um, it, Excuse the naive question, because I think you may have said something about this, but what if you consider superpositions of spin states? Is this now an unstable configuration, or is this something you could think about? What? Uh, I'm not sure. What do you, can you, so when I was talking yeah, about, so, just, sorry, go just ahead. Talking, sorry uh, I'm just talking about, you know, the, it's a classical field, and I'm interfering the waves associated with this classical field, just like we would do in any any field, including electromagnetism. Right. Um, but you, what kind of so? So I guess yeah. So I guess could I not think of it as like a superposition of polarizations or something? Is there some subtlety yeah. there? No, you could do that. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. You, so interfere different pol. You could say that the waves you are talking about are from different polarizations. Certainly. Okay. Okay. And it would exist there as well. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's something, cause I, I, you know, I wonder like how yeah, that may be a more, you know, it, it might have a more unique signature or something than maybe superposing amplitudes. But anyway, just a thought. Thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Niklas, you want to go? Yeah. Uh, hi Mustafa. Uh, thanks for the talk. That was very entertaining point. Uh, so I have a question in regards to micro lensing. Uh, if one were to think of, let's say, the magnification in microlensing in between the scalar and vector case, uh, 
uh, for let's say the simulations and the work you've been done. What could you could one expect? Let's say difference in regards to being able to discriminate, let's say the solid tops that you would create here, and what would one expect? Let's say for the difference in these scenarios. So I think there are two ways I can answer. So I'm right now at least the solid tops I'm talking about are not so compact that I would think too much about microlensing from them. But there is an effect on lensing in the following sense that suppose you have caustic surfaces because of microlensing that you have. Now this interference pattern in the middle really screws up the wave fronts that are propagating towards you uh, because they get the gravity, just gravitationally, right? Like mm -hmm. they really get buzzed out. So as a result of which in the scalar dark matter, people are already thinking about this, of course, uh, and, you are, you, and there you do get it screwed up. In the vector case, you will get it screwed up, but there will be a one thing that will distinguish the two in the mm -hmm. sense that in the given theory, there is there will be a relationship between the typical amplitude of the fluctuations mm -hmm. and the size, the physical size of the fluctuations. Okay. Uh, in the scalar case and the vector case, the physical size of the fluctuations, assuming you are assuming same boson mass, or mm -hmm. even if you mm -hmm. assume same boson mass, the physical size of the fluctuations will be the same because that's just determined by de Broglie scale, which is just determined yep. by gravity but the amplitude of the fluctuations are different in the two cases. So in principle, again, it's only a square root of three difference, not huge. Sure. There is a distinction between different spin fields here. Mm -hmm. You could potentially probe because of this. So I think it's an interesting thing to pursue, but I would more, more say, I mean, I learned about this from Simona Vigetti, uh, of course, uh, about how the, the patterns of lensing uh, mm -hmm. Had significantly affected by these uh, by these things in the middle, and I think yeah. it might be worthwhile. Thank you. All right, uh, all right, thanks. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Mustafa, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, I think we should move to Ariel Sidinski, who is going to talk about vacuum energy, large scale magnetic fields, and not trivial topology. So, um, okay, we should so. I have to share the screen now. Yeah, please. So whatever you want. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, in this case, I can start. <clears throat> Okay, thanks uh, for inviting me to speak at this meeting. And first of all, thanks uh, uh, Mishu Shaposhnikov uh, who invited me to speak here. So let me say uh, precisely the main goal and what I uh, would like to discuss. So essentially this talk is uh, based on uh, uh, two recent papers with Andre and myself, but actually there are many other papers uh, on the topic, and I will mention that. Okay, so let me formulate from the very beginning uh, the main claim uh, uh, of, uh, of this talk. So the main claim is the following, that essentially there is a dynamical vacuum energy which can be generated as a result of dynamics of non-trivial topological se uh, sectors in gauge theory. It is a definitely new, uh, type of energy. And I will actually formulate what energy I'm talking about in the next slide. So essentially, uh, there are no any additional scalar fields. There are no any additional degrees of freedom whatsoever. So I'm talking about the dynamics of the topological sectors. And I'll explain in a precise way what do I mean. So uh, the way how I want to proceed, I want to formulate actually that some computations can be done in a very precise and under complete theoretical control in hyperbolic space. And I'll show that the main claim uh, can be explicitly seen there. So now after that, I discuss applications. There are uh, two different applications when vacuum energy can be actually important. It is definitely uh, uh, inflation and people discuss inflation here a lot, but I want to also discuss about dark energy. And finally, uh, there are actually observations that uh, magnetic field uh, exists in our uh, nature, exists in our universe, 
Most important part, not what is the actually uh, intensity of the magnetic field, but uh, important part that actually people observe and claim that there is a huge correlation length on the level of one giga per second more, and it is very hard to understand. So I'll just discuss uh, about magnetic field as well. Okay. First of all, as I said, it is a new type of energy. <clears throat> so before I discuss energy, I have to define what energy I'm talking about, because energy can be defined in many different ways. So what I'm saying, I'm saying the following. There is a new type of energy we normally do not discuss, and it is so-called non-dispersive uh, uh, energy. So it cannot be expressed in terms of the conventional S matrix elements, conventional scattering amplitudes. It is non-dispersive. And uh, it definitely uh, contradicts to a very old folk theorem uh, from 60s and 70s, which uh, uh, essentially claims that everything can be expressed in terms of S matrix elements. The claim is no, it is not. And I'll show actually uh, some latest computations which explicitly show that. Okay, so uh, what this energy is uh, I'm talking about? This energy comes from very non trivial dynamics of uh, topological sectors in strongly coupled gauge uh, system and tunneling transition between them. So the energy I'm talking about is definitely non local in nature cannot be expressed in terms of the local curvature, in terms of the gradient expansion, and it cannot be expressed in terms of any local characteristics which you normally uh, use for the scalar, in terms of the scalar potential for inflation, for example. So the most important characteristic here is how long. So, but before I discuss the energy, let me formulate this energy in something what we know and love for already many, uh, for many years, for 40 years since uh, 80s. So essentially, I want to explain this energy in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, topological susceptibility, which is a correlation function. We know about this correlation function essentially everything. But uh, the point is that this correlation function is expressed in terms of the energy second derivative. So the energy I'm talking about, non-dispersive energy, is precisely uh, can be understood in terms of this topological susceptibility. So this is an old story, and uh, a young generation probably don't know about the story, but old generation for sure knows the story quite well. Uh, uh, about so-called uh, uh, eta prime problem. So let me formulate again from the very beginning, what kind of correlation function I'm talking about. I'm talking about Victi product, not Dyson T product. So there is a huge difference when I'm talking about Victi product, it's definitely a derivative with respect to a partition function. Okay, so the point is the following, what we know about this correlation function. It does not vanish in spite of the fact that it is actually a derivative. More than that, this correlation function has a wrong sign in the sense that if it is actually uh, saturated by physical degrees of freedom, it must be negative in Euclidean space-time, but it is actually positive. More than that, this correlation function is known to have a pole. And uh, in all times, we call this Veneziana ghost. It is not physical degrees of freedom. It is a not propagating degrees of freedom. For example, in QCD, we know that we do not have any massless degrees of freedom. But nevertheless, there is a actually massless pole, which is not related to the physical degrees of freedom. OK. so. When we are talking about dispersive part of the energy, it is a always negative sign. Again, I use Euclidean metric here. But essentially, in order to resolve this problem, we know that does exist in nature. We must have a positive sign. So what Witten did a long, long ago, he simply postulated that there is such kind of term. It does not contradict anything. It does not contradict the quantum field theory. That's it. That's exactly the way how Witten approached the problem. Veneziano did actually something more. 
Venetiana assumed that there is a Venetiana ghost with the actually wrong sign. And that's exactly the way how he saturated this correlation function, which must be positive, as I said. So what does it come from in terms of the uh, uh, gauge field theory? That's a wrong sign. They cannot be described in terms of the physical uh, propagating degrees of freedom. That's for sure, because it is a wrong sign. But it is related to the dynamics of the topological sectors. Again, it can be explicitly tested, and I'll show a couple of slides how it can be tested. And it is related to so-called non-local large gauge transformation. It's related to the holonomy. And that's precisely the holonomy may exhibit some kind of long range features. Even so, we definitely know that UCD has a gap. So in uh, condensed matter systems, we definitely know such kind of phenomena does exist. So it is not something uh, unusual. So you have a gap, but nevertheless, you have some kind of sensitivity to very large distances. So I'll show again something uh, uh, from condensed matter, which uh, teaches us uh, where does it come from. So effects have, uh, which I'm talking about have been explained in terms of topological susceptibility, but the energy, which is a, my main interest, it's energy, is essentially the second derivative with respect to theta. We definitely know that is zero, but nevertheless, the point is that the second derivative is not is not zero. So essentially, all features I discussed for the topological susceptibility, I essentially apply to the energy. So it is non-dispersive in, uh, in uh, nature. It cannot be formulated in terms of any local fields like inflaton. And nevertheless, it is definitely not. OK. So the next slide. So let me show that what I'm talking about is not some kind of fiction. So uh, it is a latest simulation and the well-known and well-understood part is definitely this negative part. It's uh, related to the physical degrees of freedom. And latest people definitely know about the so-called uh, term, contact term related uh, to the positive sign. And this uh, contact term, has pure infrared uh, nature, not UV red nature. And again, latest people know that's quite well, and that's exactly the way how we know about the resolution of so-called U1 problem long ago. Okay, now, <clears throat> now I'm applying this uh, non-trivial ideas about the energy to inflation and dark energy. Let me formulate in uh, uh, some precise way. So uh, let's define the holonomy and we all know what holonomy is. It's just exactly the defined in this way. And I introduce this parameter uh, 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 T, <clears throat> uh, the way how it's uh, formulated. So now, what is the definition of the energy in this framework? So the definition is the following, and actually it comes from Zildovich. I'll show the uh, next slide. The definition is the following. So what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to compute vacuum energy on a non-trivial manifold. For example, this one, but uh, definitely we need to know the sitter, but uh, let's do what we can do. Just let's do the computations where we can do the computations. And after that, we subtract the same energy, but uh, in Minkowski space time. And what's left, it's precisely the definition for uh, uh, vacuum energy. The main point here that this subtraction prescription is consistent with the conventional subtraction of UV divergences, because this non-local function of geometry such as eta definitely cannot be removed by any UV contact term. So it is, an, as I said, it is an infrared physics. It has nothing to do to the UV uh, contact terms. Now, let me uh, say some historical remarks on that. <clears throat> Where does it come from, this definition? Actually, it was formulated 
by Zildovich long, long ago. So essentially the way how he defined vital energy in uh, cosmology precisely in this way. And more than that, he actually estimated dark energy today by substituting uh, uh, proton mass uh, in uh, his computations. But the way how actually people recently discuss it, just I know from uh, uh, Björken, he used to come to uh, UBC Vancouver many times and we had uh, just uh, infinitely long talks on that. Uh, I know from Ralph, <coughs> but <coughs> sorry, most importantly, uh, the way how I accepted this idea comes from Grisha Valovic, who actually uh, uh, discusses in the many, many, many different uh, 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 meetings uh, he organized, so-called cost lab meetings, cosmology and laboratory activities. So that's the way how I know about this uh, uh, definition. Okay, so now, according to the definition, what I'm supposed to do I am supposed to compute vacuum energy on a some non-trivial manifold, okay? That's exactly what I am supposed to do. Normally, what you say, you say the following, wait, curvature for specifically for this hyperbolic space, proportional kappa square, and therefore you immediately say, oh, you have a kappa square. Remember what I am saying, kappa, it's roughly speaking Hubble in future. So Hubble uh, square is so small number, so there is nothing to discuss. Now, the most important point here that it is not just local curvature, which normally people discuss. It could be a linear effect, that there is a linear correction. And this is the main point of my talk. And I can actually do the computations and show the linear correction which is a numerically, parametrically is enormous effect. So what does it come from this linear part? So as I said, I can actually check this linear part in a number of different models and I'll show precisely where does it come from, but there is a linear correction. Again, remember the curvature is kappa square. Nevertheless, my claim is that there is a linear. And it is explicitly proportional to the holonomy. So if holonomy is zero, there is nothing to discuss, right? Okay, so that's a, a formula for the vacuum energy between non-trivial space and trivial space. Okay, so that's exactly uh, the way how I do my computations in a, some specific, uh, uh, specific models where computations can be explicitly done. There are so-called colorons in a, a non-abelian gauge field series. And uh, the colorons with non-trivial holonomy because colorons previously were introduced into the theory many years ago with a trivial holonomy. And Pierre Van Bal actually introduces colorons with a non-trivial holonomy. And normally people expected that the colorons contribution is going to be zero in thermodynamical limit. Nevertheless, the point is the following. You can do explicit computations and you can demonstrate that essentially it is not the case. It is actually gives you infrared finite contribution. So let me say about this color on configurations, what they are. They can be sought as a, some kind of non-trivial superposition of n different monopoles with the topological charges one over n. So each, uh, charge does not exist separately, but the superposition of n objects does. And it is actually integer topological. And there are many, many different phenomena such as the confinement can be understood as a percolation of this fractionally charged monopoles. Again, this is a long story, but nevertheless, I want to mention about the way how the computations have been done. They were based actually on color. And let me show one precise specific technical point where actually the linear effect enters the problem. The linear effect, and as I said, I can do the computations in the hyperbolic space. So in this case, there is a huge difference between uh, uh, these two cases. 
in one case, when you defined on R3, that's well known the uh, uh, behavior for the monopole solution. And here on hyperbolic space, it is a different. And this difference is related to the actually uh, precise parameter kappa, which I mentioned, which some kind of cut off on the very, very large scales. So eventually this difference is translated to the actually uh, so-called different fugacities in, uh, in the computations I do in, uh, in uh, 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 zero mode determinant. That's precisely the difference between two computations. I don't do. I don't want to show all the technical details. I actually uh, precisely formulated. But what I want to say, once I know the energy, and remember, this energy has a non-perturbative nature. It cannot be expressed in terms of any scalar degrees of freedom. It is exactly generated as a, 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 a result of topological sector. I can uh, do the computations for the pressure and for the density. And uh, I do subtraction, which I mentioned uh, before due to Zildovich. And you can explicitly see that essentially pressure and uh, raw density is exactly one and the same correction. And uh, such that it looks like as a, a cosmological constant. But of course, it is a not cosmological constant which I introduced from nowhere. It is a, actually something which is a generated and related to the uh, infrared physics. So uh, omega is minus one exactly in this specific case. So the driving force for the de Sitter behavior here, it is a non-local dynamics of the inflaton field. Uh, but inflaton field does not exist here. So the minus one here, it is not related to the scalar field. It is related to the dynamics of the topological sectors. So it is a Casimir type vacuum energy, but it is not related to the fluctuation of the conventional uh, dynamical degrees of freedom. It is related to the uh, dynamics of non uh, non dispersive degrees of freedom, something similar to the Veneziana ghost, which has a wrong sign. By the way, this wrong sign for the Veneziana ghost gives you precisely the plus sign for, uh, for the vacuum energy when you subtract. Okay, so now uh, physical question. How it is possible that you have a system with a gap because it is a gauge field theory could be ever sensitive to arbitrary large distance. That's exactly the claim. Because let's consider a simple uh, Aronov-Kasher effect. It is a something dual to Aronov-Bohm effect. So essentially what we do, we insert uh, a charge into the superconductor. And in this case, you definitely know, once the charge in the superconductor, the electric field is screen. For sure we know it is screen, no doubt about that. But now what we do, we take a, a magnetic flow of flux, magnetic uh, solenoid at a very, very large distances. And what we do, we make a very, very large circle at a very, very large distances. And I am asking the very simple question. I was sensitive to the charge inside of the superconductor. And of course the answer is yes, of course. It's something which is very similar to our own bohm effect. And if you look at the original aronov kasher effect, you will see precisely that the way how you see this effect occurs, you have to sum over all these topological sectors in quantum electrodynamics in two dimensional uh, uh, surface perpendicular to the uh, uh, solenoid. So long range order in the system emerges because of the large gauge transformation operator. So that separator, which we know, and it is actually generated by holonomy and non-local operator sensitive to phi infrared physics, similar to the modular operator in Aronov-Kasher effect. So in the paper by Aronov-Kasher, they call this modular operator. But in the particle physics community, we call this actually a large gauge transformation operator. But it is identically the same non-local operator. Okay, so now the next question, if you are talking about uh, inflation, uh, how does it end? Um, reheating, essentially, we are talking about the reheating. <clears throat> so 
So if we do not have any, uh, any uh, coupling to the uh, standard model particles, in this case, it is a final destination of our universe. So you have a de-seater and this de-seater forever. It would be the final destination. Now, what we do, we just uh, switch on uh, standard model particles. And in this case, the procedure, what is the procedure for computations now? The procedure goes as follows. So again, you have a gauge field theory. And in this case, we have to describe all these non-trivial topological sectors in the presence of this uh, standard model particles. You have to discuss all these non-trivial colorons with non-trivial holonomy defined on R3 uh, as one. One should compute the corresponding uh, pass integral accounting for all these tunneling effects in terms of uh, uh, when the coupling constant is non-zero. And one should compute uh, P and rho as usual in the presence of all massless standard model gauge fields. Again, at a large scale, all our gauge bosons are definitely, uh, are definitely mass. Okay, so you can proceed uh, uh, along this way, but technically I cannot. And I believe nobody can do that because technically you simply don't know how to actually formulate uh, 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 the tunnelic effects in the presence of these uh, fields. And there is an analogy with the dynamical Casimir effect, and I'll mention this analogy later. So essentially, what the point is here, that uh, when you do such kind, let's assume that you do such kind of computations. In this case, the energy related to this topological sectors will be actually transformed to the standard model particles from the configuration, not conventional configurations of, uh, uh, of these gauge fields, but from the tunneling transition. It's hard technical problem. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to compute the tunneling in the presence of these particles. But fortunately, there is a completely different technique. And this technique is known to particle physics community and it is most well known to condensed matter community oh, when you introduce so-called auxiliary fields. Uh, similar to Viniziana Ghost, essentially it is a like auxiliary field. So what the point is here that all key features can be understood using completely different uh, formulation in terms of the auxiliary topological fields. And you can actually, the way how you do that, uh, again, it is a technical part of the problem which I don't want to discuss, but the end of the story that there is a actually additional topological non-propagating field. Again, it is a very similar to the axion field, but the difference is that essentially it does not have any uh, kinetic degrees of freedom. So it does not have d mu a square. So there is no kinetic term, but nevertheless, there is a such kind of uh, constant. And again, in condensed matter physics, this technique is well known, and these auxiliary fields are actually uh, used many, many times in different uh, circumstances. So in QCD context, so essentially the point is that uh, the expectation value for this auxiliary field B, as I said, that this auxiliary field for B dot, it is a, something like mu five, which is a chiral chemical potential. People discuss the chiral or introduce the chiral chemical potential many, many times, especially uh, for the so-called chiral magnetic effect. So they discuss it uh, in QCD uh, context. But the point is that essentially once mu5 is not zero, we definitely know that there is a actually a helical instability. So all people know it, uh, that once you have something which is the uh, expectation value non-zero, you have a, 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 a helical instability. So, and identify this helical instability with actually a uh, number of P falls uh, in inflation. So what does it mean helical instability? It means that entire energy related to the mu, mu five is completely goes away. Uh, and it is a transform to the uh, physical uh, particles uh, which are actually emitted, standard model particles. 
So we identify uh, instability, uh, typical time instability with inflation. So everything is expressed not in terms of the scalar fields, not in terms of the scalar potential, not in terms of the inflaton. It is expressed in terms of the coupling constant of strongly coupled gauge field theory, alpha S. Again, do not confuse this alpha S with uh, QCD. I'll discuss in a second. But it is a gauge field theory, which is assumed to be at a uh, high level. So number of uh, faults, it is a alpha S minus two, which is a precisely how instability is developed. So roughly speaking, 100, it is a alpha S minus two. It is not something related to some kind of features of the inflaton potential. So that's the way how inflation ends here. Now, I want to have a couple of slides about the dark energy now. <clears throat> so essentially the point is the following. There is a new type of vacuum energy, which is not expressed in terms of the scattering amplitude, in terms of uh, dispersive uh, asymmetric elements. And lesson number two, that it is a result of the tunneling uh, processes in, uh, 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 in the gauge field theory. Now, we identify this new type of energy. I formulate it in terms of the weak T product uh, as a, uh, a vacuum type energy. And I discuss already inflation, what kind of actually, uh, how inflation can end with uh, some kind of new, I call this QCD bar uh, gauge field theory. Now, I want to actually say that let's discuss the QCD, a real QCD we know and love. We know the QCD scale. So in this case, the vacuum energy, it is a dark energy. Instead of lambda QCD bar, it is a lambda QCD. And I can apply all the techniques I discussed before. I can estimate all the just uh, parameters I discussed before in terms of the QCD parameter. And essentially my point is the following, just because of the linear term, in this case, dark energy, it is a proportional to the linear and I identify a uh, parameter tau, which I have actually uh, for the holonomy with uh, uh, typical Hubble minus one. In this case, numerically, it turns out that dark energy, it's about correct, 10 to, my, 10 to minus three EV4. Uh, so yeah. One minute. Say yeah, please. One minute. Oh, one minute. Okay, I am about to uh, uh, end. Okay, so essentially uh, for the uh, dark energy, I can apply all these uh, ideas and you can explicitly see that uh, uh, essentially it is about correct. So now the next, what I want to actually mention, applications to the uh, large scale magnetic field. It's almost two slides and that's it. So, there are many, many different ideas how cosmological uh, magnetic field could be generated. But the idea we are actually advocating that magnetic field uh, is known to be correlated on enormous gigaparsec scale. How it is possible? And let me show the actually uh, uh, plot from Neuronov work. So the point is the following, that actually we are talking about the gigaparsec here. And there is a constraint here. So it must be larger than 10 to minus 15 and definitely smaller than actually uh, 10 to minus 10. So we definitely know that there is a huge magnetic field on an enormous scale. Uh, how it is possible? And the way how I'm suggesting that essentially exactly applying this dark energy, how this dark energy goes to the electromagnetic field Again, it is exactly the same uh, chemical instability I mentioned before. I don't want to have, I don't have time to discuss this precisely how it goes, but most people actually know when you have expectation value here that magnetic field will be generated. Important point here that magnetic field is generated on the correlation scale where dark energy is actually. And that's uh, something what we know. And uh, estimation again can be done. And it is on the level 10 to minus 10 Gauss. 
and we definitely know how a magnetic field can be generated. So essentially, I'm uh, about to conclude. That's uh, my last slide. So essentially, the point is that uh, uh, the energy I am advocating it is has non-dispersive energy, and it can be actually really tested in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, explicitly a, a computational uh, uh, way. And technically, it is non-local in nature and cannot be expressed in terms of any degrees, propagating degrees of freedom. OK. And uh, that's about dark energy and magnetic field. So essentially, the numbers, if you substitute this linear term in terms of Hubble, if you identify, in this case, the number of uh, e-folds, it's uh, alpha minus 2, and magnetic field on the level 10 to minus 10 Gauss. That's the uh, end of the story. I stop right here. I have a couple of backup slides on physical meaning and tabletop experiments, which actually can be tested. Some ideas with the axion searches uh, 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 using this uh, non trivial, non dispersive uh, energy. And uh, I stop right here. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Daniel, for the talk. Um, questions? I see Kohei. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting call talk. I'm very, I, I got excited. So I have one comment and one question. So you said that the, the observed intergalactic magnetic field should be one gear particle scale. But as far as I understand, it, it, it could be, but for the small scales, it could be kilopartic scales. So the, so it, the, the observation just gives the, the upper bound and lower bound. Uh, no, just just to give the lower bound depending on the on the the correlation length. So the it could yeah one gear path could be fine, but the smaller scale would be okay. Then my my question is that the you said the in in, in your your proposal the magnetic field ten to minus ten ten gauss. But could you could you could you remind me that how this value is? I mean, is it the saturation of the value or? The time oh, of how the, the compute oh how the computations are proceed with the magnetic field. Yeah, so my, my question is that how you how it is determined by the 10 to minus 10, 10 gauss. Okay, so again, I don't have the slides for uh 10 to minus 10, but essentially the point is the following: it is something what we know how to do it. So uh we definitely know that uh it will be developed in stability. So yeah, you yeah. have to look exactly what kind of instability and what are the wavelengths. And after that, you just do conventional computations. So I have actually a, a, a physical review D paper uh, on the very first slide, which I mentioned on magnetic field and all mm -hmm. these computations are performed there. Uh, sorry, so I, I wonder, so, the, so I, there, there, there could be a back reaction on the, on mu five, so the so okay. So again, let let me let me explain the point here. Mm -hmm. The point is here is the following: that uh, this field is auxiliary; it does not have any kinetic term, does not. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it does couple to electromagnetic field. Okay, mm -hmm. and once this expectation value is non-zero, it is a mu five. Uh, this one. In this case, it is known that actually instability develops and magnetic field will be actually on the scale where actually this B field is. So that's exactly I do along the conventional type of computations. And that's exactly the way how magnetic field has been estimated. Uh, so in the usual case of the chiral plasma instability, the mu five, uh, mu five uh, plus magnetic helicity is conserved. But in this case, mu five, uh, Mu five or B dot does not change. Do you mean? No, no. B dot expectation value is definitely yeah. changed because, as I said, the energy from this mm -hmm. topological sectors they mm. translate, transform this energy yeah. to to, uh, to the magnetic field. Yeah. So previously, I discussed exactly this case, the way how inflation ends. So mm -hmm. it goes to the conventional. Uh, matter and that's the way how actually reheating happens but in this for qcd case for dark energy that's energy goes to electromagnetic field to magnetic field and that's exactly the original energy of dark energy 
So okay. during the time, Hubble time uh, times alpha minus two, all energy, the essentially the claim is all energy, dark energy will be translated to uh, magnetic field energy. So in this sense, so the, in the present universe is the, during the stage of the magnetic field ampli amplification due to this mechanism. Correct, but correct. Not, so not, not created yet. So correct, then correct, you, correct. You, you would predict that the magnetic field strength get long, get get stronger and stronger for the far, far future. Is it yes inside? Correct. So essentially, okay. magnetic field is produced now, today, on a very yeah. large scale. It is okay, not okay. like with inflation. Then, then the, our our future is that the the dark energy is dark energy all the dark energy converted to magnetic field. And we, we correct, the, the, correct. It is a couple. Yeah. The, 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 correct. Magnetic field coupled to dark energy. Correct. Then and the uh, in the in the future we do not have dark energy anymore because they, the older energy. Oh yeah, energy. but it takes not actually uh, ten giga years. Ten giga years yes. times alpha minus two. So forget yes. about it actually in future. But nevertheless, yes, that's a picture. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I got the point. Thank you very much. Okay. And Misha, you also got a question? Yes. Yeah, hi, Eric. Uh, hi, Misha. Yeah, okay. Uh, first question. Uh, suppose that uh, QCD is not like you can consider, but it's Higgs. -set. Then I would expect that there are no color ones you are talking about, and then all effects are gone. Is that uh, what Correct. you say? Correct. Correct. Because essentially, uh, let me go back, it depends on the mass, but if mass of the Higgs is actually sufficiently large, so let me just show precisely the way how I did the computations with uh, something what I know. So when you include Higgs, in this case, it's essentially additional uh, uh, dimensional parameter. Mm -hmm. Now for uh, uh, hyperbolic space, I have this parameter kappa, which is extremely small. Now, when you have a Higgs parameter, which is a much larger, in this case, you have a cutoff at a much different scale. So the point is the following, that when you have a Higgs, in this case, all the, just uh, there are no any uh, tunneling uh, processes whatsoever. No, no, but there are tunneling processes. They are suppressed exponentially, maybe, suppressed exponentially. but they are still okay, yeah, there. Yeah, of course, Misha. Of course, Misha, you are right. They are suppressed exponentially. They are exponentially small. But uh, essentially, we can assume that we live in a one single vacuum state. And in this case, all these topological sectors do not play any role for sufficiently large Higgs. And there is no such kind of energy. And that's precisely the reason because you could ask the following question. Well, we have actually vacuum energy. Why you are considering only QCD and you're not considering, let's say, electroweak field theory? And the answer is the following that essentially for electroweak field theory, you do not have uh, this phenomena with a very large uh, uh, tunneling between different topological sectors. You have essentially can pick up one vacuum state sector and leave with that. So when you do this subtraction between computations of the vacuum energy minus part of the in Minkowski space time, in this case, this uh, cancellation is complete. So essentially you do not have any, uh, uh, you do not have any parameters what I have here one over uh, tau mm -hmm. for the uh, large infrared uh, parameter here like uh, related to the uh, Veneziana ghost, uh, mm -hmm. to infrared physics. So for electroweak, definitely you have much larger scale. For supersymmetry, for sure you have much large scale, but nevertheless, you actually uh, uh, break the symmetries. And in this case, when you do this subtraction, this subtraction is complete and nothing left. Mm -hmm. But in uh, uh, gauge field theory like QCD, when you don't have Higgs. In this case, there is a parameter uh, one over tau. That's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. That there is a one linear term, mm -hmm. which actually are relevant only uh, when you don't have Higgs, you have a massless uh, QCD-like theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay. Well, uh, another question, chronological. So, if I believe, uh, if I believe you, then uh, my understanding is uh, that uh, inflation happens at a very low scale, and then uh, kind of reheat in temperature is of the order of lambda QCD. Is no, that right? No no, 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 no. Actually, when you apply inflation, that's uh, exactly uh, 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 for inflation again. I am not talking about exactly the QCD scale. So do mm -hmm. not confuse two different uh, vacuum energy. One, it is a QCD. In this case, it is a dark energy. It is a just a completely different story. For uh, inflation, I have to invent. I have to assume that there is another gauge field theory ah, with a different scale exists. So oh, it is okay. not QCD. Okay. And it is a larger scale. So mm -hmm. I have some uh, parameter uh, for the scale to not to interfere with electroweak field theory. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is a definitely uh, sufficiently low energy, but it must be larger than 10 to 7 GE scale. Why, why 10 to 7? Okay, so again, you <laughs> it's, uh, it's related to the fact that we, we don't have to uh, interfere with electroweak and alpha parameter enters, uh, enters the computations. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK. OK, I think I don't see any other question. Let's go. Hey, uh, so let me give another comment. So, the, the, so if in the case of inflation, the, if the, the reheating temperature is, uh, no, uh, the scale is higher than electric scale, then, then the then you reheat the universe with the uh, hyper, hyper gauge field production, right? Say again, please. So you, the inf inflation will end with the hyper gauge field production. Yeah, with the, with the conventional standard standard particle production and the way how I describe the standard uh, standard uh, particle production, yeah. as I so said. Then, yeah. so listen, listen, my study discovers that the the, it it is it is definitely associated with baryon baryon production baryon number production and it is often the case that baryon over production takes place so you need to be careful on that so the the okay, point is so, that the helical magnetic so the helical hypermagnetic fields are generated in in your, in your mechanism then after the electric symmetry breaking helical magnetic field uh, becomes helical helical hypermagnetic field becomes ah. helical electric magnetic field. at that at that time the Hypermagnetic helicity changes, and through the chiral anomaly, the baryon asymmetry is inevitably generated. And so, Misha has studied it around 20 years ago, and recently I revisited it with the, the with the, the light of in the light of the the Higgs, Higgs mass and the electric crossover, and I confirmed that the, it is likely the baryon asymmetry will not be washed out, but it is like it is likely remain. So the in such a case, if the if the heating temperature is higher than the, the electricity scale, you need to be careful on the baryon over production. Okay, so I, I I definitely didn't discuss this question. So and I didn't discuss this part. As I said, the only what I did, I uh, discussed the following that uh, I simply wanted to estimate. Uh, uh, gauge fields, just uh, in this case, it is uh, just Z, gamma, gluons, everything in terms of uh, B. And that's exactly the estimation I did. And uh, 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 I, I didn't discuss the baryon production or anything like that. But nevertheless, it's uh, just pure perturbation theory. When you're talking about baryon production, it's definitely tunneling uh, events. I didn't discuss that. It is just simply perturbation theory, which I can actually do the computation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, helical instability, I definitely know how it develops. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I yeah. know how it develops, roughly speaking, from chiral magnetic field and uh, heavy ion collisions uh, actually can be done. Again, uh, the most important part, it is a new type of uh, energy. And I always wanted to test these ideas uh, uh, with some kind of tabletop experiments. So I suggested the tabletop experiments where you can see such kind of non-perturbative Casimir uh, uh, type effect, but not because of the uh, two different polarizations, photon polarizations, but because of non-trivial tunnelings. So in okay. principle, it can be done. And because I'm uh, heavily involved to the axion search experiments, and I discussed a lot with 
experimentalism. So just the hope is that essentially it can be tested in uh, different axiom search experiments. So, yeah. With a very, very high precision. I think we are running a bit late, so I will just uh, close it here. Just thanking Ariel and all the speakers today for a very nice talk. Of course, I imagine that uh, I pass the word to Renaissance. I imagine that you can continue discussing, but yes, in case. Uh, OK, is. thank you. So thank yeah. you very much again for the talks. And, Yes, thanks to all the speakers and uh, thank you very much, Javier, uh, for sharing. Thanks, Javier, for sharing yeah, this session. Thanks, Javier. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank nice you to see you again, Javier. Bye bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. bye. Michel. Yeah, I will. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, we'll stop recording by the way. Yeah, true, true, true.